welcome you all uh, for this uh, session. And I, at the outset, I would like to thank Mr. Sridhar and, uh, and Selco Foundation for inviting me for this uh, webinar. Uh, I'm really glad to be of uh, uh, to be a part of this uh, exercise. Uh, actually, I'm new to such a program in, uh, and and in such customers, but or such entrepreneurs. Uh, because generally we have one side business based, basically being a manufacturing setup and all that, but that's that's fine. It's uh, because being the first uh, session, first discussion, I think it should be fine to have a webinar to start with, and then if required, maybe we can go for the uh, next uh, steps uh, in guiding you. First of all, I would like to appreciate. Uh, all of you entrepreneurs, because you've done a good job, you're doing a good job, actually a great job for the nation, I would say, because most of you are uh, startups and uh, also uh, uh, you are uh, creating products, developing products which are economically friendly, I mean, ergonomically friendly, uh, environmentally friendly and all that. So, and uh, this goes a long way in nation building and uh, cost reduction climate uh, control, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that's, that's a great job. Uh, and also employment creation, being entrepreneurs, I think you're creating a lot of employment for uh, people uh, of this country. And uh, so congratulations uh, to all of you and uh, my best wishes for your growth uh, and in your future endeavors, whatever it is, uh, be, uh, maybe uh, expanding the same business or diversifying the new business, whatever it is, I think that my best wishes goes to you. Uh, so, based on uh, Mr. Sridhar's uh, brief, um, actually I had uh, made a brief presentation for uh, today's uh, discussion, uh, but because that's, because it's, it could be a bit generic uh, and basic uh, because I was, I'm still not aware of exactly how much awareness is there across the audience and uh, across YouTube. But anyway, let's start with this. Uh, I would also invite you to participate and involve yourself in the discussions. Um, of course, we have a one-on-one -on -one session also later. So the details and uh, detailed uh, analysis or uh, guidance could be later on in the one-on-one -on -one sessions. But even if you have some doubts in the uh, basic sessions, uh, general presentation, uh, you're welcome to uh, go ahead with your requests or queries, which I would be glad to uh, answer uh, to the best of my uh, knowledge and uh, exposure. Thank you. So, shall I go to the screen now? Yes, yes sir. sir. Yeah. I hope you are able to see the presentation now. Yes, sir. We are able yeah. to. So, so, the topic given to me was a uh, production planning process, uh, basically aimed at uh, startups and uh, uh, companies like yours. Uh, so what uh, topics I thought I could uh, include or discuss was uh, what are the objectives of the planning exercise? What are the requirements which uh, have to be met before starting a production plan? What, what are the generally the practices uh, for setting up efficient processes? Because any process when we establish or set up, it has to be efficient. Uh, maybe initially it may not be so efficient, but over a period of time we can uh, improve the same, but still we have to aim at uh, setting up an efficient process uh, so that, I mean, the quality of the products are ensured. Uh, and there's a there's a key here, the consistent quality, because uh, it cannot be that one day the quality is good, the other day the quality is not good. So it has to be a consistent quality of products, which the consistent and efficient process only can uh, deliver. So we will discuss some of those things here. And then capacity planning, how do you calculate capacities and then how do you build the capacities and <coughs> work in uh, processes as well as the facility building? What all are required to be considered here? So we, we'll discuss some of those things. How do you ramp up the uh, production? So the, basically the objectives uh, of uh, planning exercise would be, uh, firstly, you have to estimate the current capacity. So what, what exactly you have today? So how much you can produce, how much you can manufacture, how much you can develop, whatever it is, how much, how much is the current capacity, whether it is adequate to meet the customer's demand, it could be customer's demand or your internal targets. Sometimes uh, you don't have a customer really, you will have to go and market your products outside. So it could be some of those, uh, uh, because some of the products which I thought uh, you are all making, 
maybe you don't have a ready made customer for uh, you so you might have to uh, generate your customers market your products and then uh, create your customers sell to your customers your ideas and your products so and when you do that so you may act have to have an internally your target demand it may not be an actual demand considering the market situation but it could be your internal target uh, so that's the reason i said an internal demand which is created by the management or by yourself then preparation of the capacity ramp up plan if suppose your current capacity is uh, not adequate not sufficient to meet the customers demand or your internal target then you have to create a uh, capacity so how do you ramp up the capacity you have to prepare a plan so and then when you do this normally you will have to build some contingencies in the uh, plan because there always could be exigencies be it uh, sometimes the market could go up sometimes uh, you might have issues within your plan uh, in the sense that you might have breakdowns you might have uh, material shortages or you might have some reasons of hot cuts uh, some other issues in labor whatever it is so uh, generally uh, what you need to do uh, is you'll have to build normally we build some contingencies to uh, meet the exigencies or emergency situations there could be various ways of doing it uh, which we'll discuss uh, during the planning exercise uh, it could be i mean some of the contingencies could be have an excess uh, capacity or you can have some vendors who can support you uh, you can outsource some of the uh, your processes etc etc so this is just to name a few it could be uh, specific for a particular industry it could be different for different industries so so you'll have to plan uh, suitably suitable what is suitable for your industry and what is suitable for your company and then arrive at the alternatives for uh, those uh, exigencies you build a plan generally as, as i said earlier considering the quality outputs so quality outputs could be your own uh, targeted outputs of quality uh, for example the performance of a product and then you will have to uh, check what customer expects from your product so that that quality customer expected quality is one and then there was there is always some uh, process quality which you may have to consider when you plan because normally sometimes within the process if your quality is not okay in a particular stage then the other quality of the product at the other uh, process or the further downstream processes could be affected so sometimes it's it's a, a in how in process quality requirement which you may have to think about so when you build a plan you consider all these outputs required out of uh, the product and the process that's how you build a plan and there are ways of doing it so uh, uh, when we talk about quality management system i think we'll talk about that then you plan to take care of uh, the facility availability for example you don't have machines to build some uh, process you may have to buy some machines or you might have some uh, machines which are frequently going under breakdowns so you might have some issues so or minor stoppages there could be some minor stoppages of the machine that it may not be a major breakdown but sometimes it uh, so you will have to consider those um, factors when you um, consider the facility availability and the facility capacity which you have as of now other down times as i said power availability and then there could be some supply issues supplier doesn't uh, supply on time or he supplies on time but the quality is not okay so you will have to build such things when uh, the facility is uh, and sometimes you might have to have a, a facility in house though you buy regularly from your suppliers but you might have to have some facility as a buffer so that you can do yourself in house when the first supplier is in a problem and he is not able to supply you materials then might be you can support him with your own uh, capacity so all this you you'll have to take care when uh, you are planning for the uh, facility have a plan for the future for example uh, you might have a demand for uh, current demand i mean this year's demand or whatever demand you have uh, targeted but sometimes what happens is you will also have to consider the future demand when uh, you are likely to ramp up to the maybe 20% 30% 40% so when you are buying some machines so uh, at that point of time you will have to consider future demand also because there is always a lead time for uh, developing the facility or for buying a new machine so you may have to uh, look at those things also uh, while planning for your facility 
then the once the production plan is uh, another objective is to develop a capital budget fund based on the above whatever points we discussed i mean the facilities have to be developed so what is the budget required for buying some machines or equipments or even manpower you may have to add some manpower so so what is uh, but of course capital budgeting is necessarily on capital equipment and machineries assembly lines maybe so uh, what all are required uh, sometimes land and building also uh, you might have to add uh, to meet your demand so what is your capital budget requirement for this year for next year normally this uh, is done at least for a period of 3 years considering the future demand also at that then you don't need to add going on uh, add machines every year so maybe a 3 year uh, uh, plan would be good to start with this again depends on case to case because sometimes machines are very costly and you might not have to uh, you may not be able to invest uh, every year so it might uh, meet the demand for 5 years also sometimes the machine so but anyway you have to invest now even if you have to meet for the first year demand so it happens that all those things come into picture when you do the uh, uh, production planning so how do you go about the uh, planning process so what are the prerequisites these are some of the things which you need so because i am i am i'm being a bit generic here because i am not aware of uh, what all uh, 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 what what is the awareness level at your uh, organizations but established product availability is the starting point i mean you need to have a product we have developed now so the the design is available you have already already validated the design you have proved the design by doing some experiments you have created a prototype so these things uh, you will have to do it uh, before considering the uh, ramping up of the uh, production so uh, if you don't have a validated design and if you don't have a product which can be uh, produced immediately and then sold to the market sold to the customer then there's no point in having a, a production plan and then wasting your resources uh, uh, in that so so the the, the first prerequisite is the availability of a established product whose design is validated and when you say design is validated and proven you you must have the standard design documents available uh either in print form or in soft form so normally uh, you everybody currently everybody is uh, on autocad and things like proe and all those things so many people have in soft form but anyway when you are going to uh do the productionizing or the production uh, process planning process these soft forms are sometimes created into a print and then uh, used for manufacturing purposes so standard design documents should be available the drawings the assembly drawing the main assembly the final assembly the sub assembly and then the component drawings so down down to the component level or the part level you must have a uh, drawing available of course you might not have drawings of some standard uh, um, proprietary parts like say some some belonging to some uh, supplier a standard part which you are buying from some outside supplier which you might not be designing you are just picking up from the market and then using it here but you might have you must have the specifications of the part for example a standard screw a m5 uh, allen screw which you are buying from sesundaram fasteners so the, the the details spec of that screw what you are going to use you must be having it here either in terms of in, uh, in by way of having the part number of the supplier you can have the part number of the supplier and then you can put it in your bill of material so as i said the standard bill of material must be available consisting of all the parts which go into your product uh it could it, it will also include the sub assemblies uh, i will show some of the uh, standard bill of materials uh, which uh, you can have or you you might already be having so we'll go into that so you must be having a standard bill of material which go into the uh, product so this is a must for uh, doing the uh, production plan then when it comes to process now you have the product now the a broad process design must be available uh the complete process flow from starting till ending what all you want to do in house what all you want to uh, buy outside so the entire value stream must be uh, uh, map sort of and then you must be having the process flow diagram with you uh, so that you can always uh, uh, look at the capacities and then uh, plan for the capacity so the final main assembly process you start with that say for example and then there could be some sub assemblies different sub assemblies which go into the main assembly and then there could be a man component manufacturing process so when it comes to component manufacturing and sub assembly generally many companies 
some of these things are outsourced some of those things are done in house so if it is a core competency related uh, part for a service assembly then many companies would like to make it in house and not outsource it for want of for want of secrecy and uh, confidentiality purpose so they don't uh, give it out they do it but if it is a standard component a turn part or a mill part or whatever it is a fabricated part so test part so these parts can always be procured outside uh, from some standard vendors uh, so that you don't need to invest on those uh, equipment and uh, your costs can be uh, lower otherwise your capital expenditure budget would be much higher when you do everything in house and the manpower resources also you might have to do so there is always a risk involved in the capital expenditure and there could be some people who are having competency in those uh, uh, components so, so for example a pressed part he is already a pressed component manufacturer then you can go and directly buy from him uh, by giving your drawing so that should not have any problem so that way the process design uh, and the selection you you have to do upfront uh, so that's what i can i said broad process design you have the process flow and then have some sort of an understanding of uh, whether you are doing it in house or you are doing it outside and buying it from your vendors then the machines list of machines available the once the process is available you you already know your process then which are the machines which are available for you in house as of now uh, which are not available whether you are going to buy outside now those machines you will have to decide so those list of machines available in for manufacturing you must be have then the current manufacturing cycle times process wise machine and time. so here this is what is very important now. so when you do a production plan you will have to have the current uh, cycle times of the process i will i'll uh, when when we go forward i will also explain some of those uh, terms used in this cycle time and uh, calculation of that so whatever is the manufacturing cycle time currently so you must have documented those things for each process it, it could be component manufacturing it could be sub assembly it could be mixed so some of those uh, processes could be automatic or machine dependent so the machine cycle time will decide the output some of those things could be labor oriented or it's fully a manual work pattern so what is the manual cycle time which uh, cycle time which the man takes or two three people take for uh, doing the uh, process or operation so you will have to record that so that uh, you can calculate the uh, capacities of the uh, process list of bought out and subcontracted items matter so now when you say when you are, you want to do some processes in house but some processes some components you don't want to do in house so you are going to either buy it out or you do subcontracting that is when you do subcontracting it means uh, it's not a fully bought out item you you do some processes in house for example you buy a raw material you do some machining and then you give it outside for some subcontract item like say a plating or a welding or so there is some value addition at the uh, vendor end but basic raw material and the basic component you provide it so this could be some of the uh, uh, subcontracted items uh, that's the definition of subcontracting it is not fully bought out a fully bought out item is you just give a purchase order the vendor gives you fully made the component for example a turn part or milled part or a uh, pressed part whatever it is so he gives you the component which you uh, raise a purchase order man so uh, which supplier gives you what item so you must be having a list of items if you already have some known uh, vendors then you just register or if you don't know then you have to say that I, uh, we don't know then then you have to find a vendor for that so as i said a, a typical bill of material uh, could look like this but it could be different ways so but i'm just saying here uh, showing here so say for example there is a wall and then this, this is a part number there is a sub assembly here so there is a sub assembly and then there is a sub part number so these two part numbers quantity 4 each could go into the sub assembly so you will have to do the sub assembly in house maybe or you can also buy it outside so, so this so source there are some sources given here so that means these parts are sourced outside and you do the sub assembly there could be some gasket again two numbers two numbers there is a source clip screw body some nut and bolt tube assembly again three parts here which go into that sub assembly these are the sources like this you will have to have an entire uh, bill of material for the entire product right uh, uh, so finally all these sub assemblies will go into the main assembly so there is a coil assembly there is a spring 
So there is a uh, core assembly. So the spring goes into the core assembly. Sorry, spring is different. Core assembly, there are two parts here. So you break down your bill of material into each sub assembly and part, and then which goes into what. So you will have to have a map of that. And then uh, so that this helps you uh, in deciding what is done in house, what is done outside, uh, and uh, which have to be ordered outside, which have to be uh, manufactured. Across. So this is how uh, a typical bill of material will look, but it could be different ways. You could have a tree diagram uh, saying that this is what is this. I will show you another, uh, when I come to the process plan also, outline process chart, I will show you another way of uh, looking at this uh, uh, bill of material. So this bill of material will consist of the entire parts quantity also each component how much how many quantities you have so uh, and then you could have a sub assembly so four numbers four numbers means four could go into one assembly and there could be two sub assemblies uh, uh, in the main assembly so it could be different uh, differently used so you will have to have all the details of that uh, when do while doing the process planning now uh, this is what is a uh, process flow when i said it so you need to have a complete uh, map of the entire process flow. So the process flow like this, it's, it looks like this. So when you have a sub, you have all suppliers here, this is your plant or the company. So you will have a uh, plant or company, then you have a customer. So this is the total value stream. So when you say total value stream, it means the total entire suppliers to this. But supplier, you only have to give orders, you don't do uh, anything there so you have to once you get the parts you do the assembly or the manufacturing here and then you supply to the customer so you start the supplier end and then you do the uh, you write down the in-house processes inside the plant till the product is dispatched to the customer the entire value stream you have to map so that you know what you are going to do in-house here itself you will know what is it i am just giving you a, a generic uh, map here but you will have to do product wise uh, and process wise uh, for your uh, various products. So your product could be having variants also, but a, a common uh, value stream could uh, hold good for uh, three to four variants. If it's a totally new product, then you will have to have a new uh, value stream map. So this is just an example of how uh, the value stream is drawn. It is, uh, it looks complicated, but it could be made into a simpler uh, way. I mean, what I'm saying is I, I included here a lot of things like schedules and all that, but this is how a manufacturing will work. For example, suppliers will supply to, uh, to us. You have a process A, for example, a machining or a welding. Process B, again, there could be another machining. Then assembly. So when you look at these processes, when this, there could be parallelly also. They, there are now, I have written it as a serial process. There could be some parallel processes going downside, which again come into this assembly. So once you do this, then you write the assembly. And then uh, after this, uh, you do the assembly and then it goes to shipping. So when the shipping is nothing but your stores or uh, area where you want to ship to the customer, then the, it goes to the customer. You normally have a, see, generally the comp uh, companies will have uh, uh, departments uh, for uh, purchase, department for suppliers, and there could be some marketing and sales and uh, support for customers, open to the customers. Then for manufacturing, you generally have a production planning and control department. Some companies have done away with this process because now mostly the uh, MRP or the ERP software takes care of this uh, exercise. So you don't have uh, many people in this department called uh, product production planning and department, but there could be one or two coordinators who look at the uh, ERP plans and then uh, do some coordination between the departments, such as sending the order schedules to process A, process B, assembly, and then a shipment list to the customer. So these could be, so the customer gives order schedules. <coughs> PPC department gives the order schedules to suppliers and also to the different processes in manufacturing. Now, I have written here, See, normally when you uh, do a process map, you also write what are the cycle times, what is the generally the uptime here, how many shifts you are running for each process. This gives you an idea how much is your capacity and whether it is meeting your uh, required uh, targeted cycle time, etc. So, and then uh, there are some boxes here. So, these are a bit complicated, but what I'm saying is when you uh, write down all these things in your uh, entire process map, then you will uh, uh, have an idea which are the areas which you need to work on. So, uh, like this, you will have to give every uh, every process the cycle time. Uh, 
uh, and the uptime. Uptime is just generally how much is your output there, uh, whether it is 85%, 95%. Etc. So these are some things which are uh, the uh, cycle times and the value added times. Normally, when you measure uh, how much is your value added time uh, as compared to your total processing lead time, it gives an idea of your performance. Also. So when you talk about lean manufacturing and other uh, advanced manufacturing techniques, then you'll go into this. Right now, you don't need to worry too much about this. You might start with a simple uh, process map uh, or a process flow diagram and then uh, uh, see what all planning you need to do. So this is one. Uh, if I may ask one question. Uh, yes, yes, please go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, no. In the previous, uh, when you talked about uptime, eighty-five percent. That means eighty-five percent of the time, that process is uh, available. Yeah, exactly. So suppose you have an eight-hour shift. So normally, eighty-five percent of the time only is your output. You you are getting your output. So balance fifteen percent. Either either it is exactly. gone in uh, breakdowns, okay. uh, or it goes in your uh, uh, idle time. In some other time, I mean, material shortages or waiting for some operator, whatever could be the inefficiencies in the system. So those things contribute to that uptime percentage. So normally, uh, if you higher the uptime percentage, the better it is. So sometimes, but in uh, manufacturing, you cannot have 100% uptime. So normally, you have an uh, based on past data, you look at this uh, uptime percentages, and when you do the planning, you do. It with some uh, contingency planning. So uh, you, you take some 80%, 85% or whatever, even if you have a 90% as your current uptime. So, but actually the, uh, here what you write is, whatever is your uptime currently, whatever you have, uh, you're achieving for the last few uh, months or whatever it is. So, so you take a time period and then see what exactly is it. But if it is consistent, is a good benchmark to consider? 85% is a good benchmark in my opinion, because this is, Overall, it is considering uh, all kinds of uh, breakdowns like uh, breakdowns, material shortages, power shortages, everything. So I think 85% is a reasonably good benchmark to start with. And generally, uh, many companies many companies have much lower than this. Okay, okay. This what we're seeing. <laughs> it depends on, of course, it depends on the process. For example, assembly. Assembly, 85%, I would say it is uh, not a good benchmark. It could be at least 90%. Whereas machining, because most of the assembly uh, processes are manual, generally, generally. So it is uh, not much of automation here, not much of uh, machinery used. So when you have machines used, then you have breakdowns, stoppages, and all that. Uh, so, but in manual cases, the, that the output should be higher. So uptime, 85% in assembly, as you rightly said, maybe it's not really a, a good number, but I'm just giving an example here. Okay. But in machining, building, and all the other areas where there are some uh, manufacturing areas, no? so there are some machines involved, power involved, and all that. So you might have a lower uh, uptime percentage. So you consider that when you are doing the planning process. Okay. Yeah, thank you. So uh, now this is, uh, sorry, this is another. Um, This is, an, this is another way of looking at uh, your uh, process flow. Uh, for example, the, 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 here I have given the different processes. This is a, a pertaining to a particular product. Now, there are some assembly processes here. What are the components which go into this? For example, there's a terminal here, there's an assembly here, there's an, again a, a, a component here. So these two go into this assembly here. Then there is another component here which comes into this, this place. So after this subassembly is done, this and this power zero diode, two, for example, then you go into the press fitting and pumping. So there is a sequential process going on, and which are the components or subassemblies which go into this at what stage is depicted here. This is a good way of uh, depicting your process flow. For example, this is a final say, uh, whatever product you are doing, and then what are what is the last stage of the final assembly, and then at each stage, what are the operations uh, you start with? You start with some component here. Uh, there's a frame or a, 
uh, body or whatever it is, then what are the things which go into those things uh, into the assembly? You just go into that and then sequentially you can write down which are the components which are going into this. This also gives an idea of what are the components involved at each stage which go into the sub-assembly or your product. So this is also a good way of depiction of your process plan uh, or a production plan or a production process basically. So different processes are written here. Again, for example, there's a wire which goes into process seven. And then there is after process eight, there are there is another sub turning, there's a component called post data. And then this is uh, this is a machine to component. And then you have two operations here turning and turning two. And then it goes after this, there's another component here. This is a, there are two parts here, there is a component here. The, sorry, there's a one part which are which are two stages of process here. And then which go into this sub assembly here, and then finally there's a so I'm just giving an example of an outline process chart which depicts how the process flow takes place in your product uh, and what, which are the components which go into at each stage. There could be several other branches here, then there could be another branch here which goes into this. So there are different, uh, this is another way of uh, depiction of the process flow, which is a very good way of uh, looking at the entire process sequence, which with the concerned uh, uh, limbs giving uh, which are the components which go into at each stage. So this, this is also another way of uh, uh, process flow diagram. This is another way of uh, looking at the process flow diagram. There are the different, uh, as I said, is again, here you, you write down the operation description. This is the operation sequence number. And then you have what the operation sequences. But this is only a process flow diagram, which doesn't give you the parts here. So this is only a process flow diagram. Uh, but it says which are the operations here, whether it's a fabrication or it's a moving operation or it's a storing operation process or it's an inspection process, it's a rework process, scrap or contain. So this is another format which people use. And here you write what is product number, what are the part numbers here, what is the date of this document, what is the revision number. This is important because normally when you start with, you might have a process, but there will always be improvements in the process. And then you change the process, update your process based on either cycle time improvements or your process improvements or process changes, or there could be some uh, requirements from the uh, customer where the product uh, a bit uh, is changed, the design itself is changed, and then you have a different process which will go into this. Or there could be some complaints from the customer in quality related areas. It could be internal complaints. It could be internal in process uh, uh, rejections which contribute to that. So, so based on those things, when you do an analysis and then uh, when you uh, do a root cause analysis and come to some action plans, you might end up saying that this process is not okay. I would like to change this process to this. So whenever you do this, so you will have to have a uh, revision of the process flow diagram and then keep on changing this. This is a very live document and which you are supposed to um, uh, change it, update it, review it periodically based on other factors like uh, your quality outputs or your production outputs or process improvements, what you do based on uh, customer complaints or whatever be the case. So this is another uh, example of a process flow diagram. This the earlier diagram shows the entire process and then it says what are the area which are the components which are going into this. So this is one way of uh, uh, depicting. This is another way of depicting where it says only the process uh, sequence but it gives the uh, if you see here there is there's a class there's significant product characteristics. For example the output of the process in terms of the product output there could be some characteristics of the component for example a pulling strength of a, a joint or whatever it is. So, uh, welding quality, those things you'll, uh, you'll have to write down here because these are the things which you need to take care in your uh, detailed work instruction for the process and then your detailed control plan or a quality control plan which you have to prepare, uh, which I'll show you later on. So, when a quality control plan is prepared, then you'll have to look at it how it, uh, we can control the uh, quality at each stage of the process so that at the end, the product comes out with a good quality or there is no rejection or rework. The, similarly, the significant process characteristics. There are product characteristics, there are process characteristics. So for example, as I said earlier, in a particular stage, there could be some process characteristics which are not really envisaged in the, as a product output. but as a process, there could be some process outputs which are required to be measured uh, and controlled at each stage. Otherwise, the end product will not be uh, okay. So, so you'll have to list out all those things when you do this. So generally, these things are done as a 
cross functional team so when the process flow diagram is done it's done as a cross functional team uh, from the manufacturing department uh, the design department the quality department and the engineering or manufacturing unit so i am not very sure how uh, how big your organizations are or whether you have an organization structure like that but but anyway so these are the things which these are some good practices i am uh, mentioning uh, because instead of one person doing this when a team of people do this so you have two three brains uh, coming into uh, preparation of this uh, process flow diagram or the production planning so so that there are all things are taken care to meet the output requirement which uh, may not have any flaws or no defects there still could be something but you again you review that and then uh, do some improvements in the the process now when you uh, demand forecast so the, uh, this is uh, the first step so when you want to uh, uh, build a production plan or a capacity plan the first step is your demand forecast as i earlier said so you will have to estimate your demand if you have to have some customers region wise or it could be region wise it could be state wise it could be whichever way you want you like some people have zone wise not east like that then you break it to different customers uh, etc so it could be like that so or it could be some targeted customers so you have your target customer i don't have all the customers so i have, i have only these people who i am targeting so uh, because i cannot go for the entire customer pool i can have only these target customers like this. or you you if it's not a uh, as i said earlier if you don't have a, a customer as of now you may have to look at customers newly uh, you have to build some customers you have to market your products and then so considering all this you will have to uh, arrive at a demand data so which is a starting point for your uh, capacity calculation or capacity ramp up plan or your production planning process so uh, customers is one thing and then existing and new customers there could be existing customers you are looking at some new customers this time last year i had these customers this set of customers this time i am going to so last year i was working in karnataka only now i have i want to start it i want to start the uh, selling of my products to andhra pradesh maybe tamil nadu or maybe delhi or punjab so uh, being in the agriculture industry so so it could be uh, like that so you will have to look at this existing customers also you will have to also look at your uh, prospective new customers whom you are targeting for your enhancement of uh, uh, orders or you know Uh, selling of your products, prospective customers, as I said, especially in new areas and new products. You can also have some new products, so variants you can have. So all these things you have to put it and then uh, uh, estimate the demand, because some of the variants uh, will uh, will follow the same process. So the process uh, the capacities, uh, I mean the process flow diagram or the process uh, sequence or the uh, process plan may not be drastically different for. Uh, a product variant but as long as it is not a different totally different new product still you might have some parts which are common to product a product b so each of these uh, those individual processes you might have to look at considering all the products for example a component a can go into product a product b product c product d so considering all these uh, quantities you might have to plan for the capacity of that particular component which is on going on as particular machine so these things are to be considered well uh, when you estimate the demand and calculate the uh, capacity so you also have to estimate uh, the requirements uh, yearly you have start with yearly and then you break down to monthly weekly daily because some of the customers uh, give a see normally in automotive uh, sector it looks like this i mean it's it's a mass production so of course your industry is different but i'm just giving you some idea automotive industries they give a, a yearly uh, projection Uh, and then uh, that is actually given on a monthly basis. So monthly you will have two hundred per month or hundred thousand per month, thousand per month, ten thousand per month, etc. etc. And then they release schedules on a weekly basis. So this week I need this. This week I need this. So that's how it goes. It's based on the customer's uh, requirement and his production plan or his assembly plan. So it all depends on uh, the customer here. So but the nature of industry decides that. Some companies like so for example a dye industry. it is one off case and everybody gives an order and then you have to manufacture that so similarly your products also some of your products also uh, could be like this uh, i i'll i'll uh, go into the um, 
uh, how these products are different from the other products uh, in, in, the, in the process planning. But what I want to say is these kind of products may not be in a mass production scale. Uh, so and you might not have customers also, but you will have to have a demand data uh, at least on a monthly basis so that you can uh, plan for the uh, capacities. So because normally things uh, uh, at least on a monthly basis you plan, then it, it should be fine for the production planning. For example, here that uh, I have written table here in a table product, there could be five or six parts here. Historical monthly demand data. For example, last year's data you, you took 100, 150 per month, and this it may not be so high for you, but I'm just giving you an idea. Uh, you have to map a demand like this. So once you do this, you took you take the average per month of last year. So say for example, 130. But then uh, sorry. so and then you have a forecast. You took the uh, you take the historical data. You also look at your marketing department, what they say, if you have a marketing department, some cases you might not have a separate marketing engineer or a marketing department. Some of your owners could do the business development, maybe yourself. So you'll have to look at what exactly is your forecast for the, the coming year uh, and on a monthly basis. And then, then you, do, you look at the, uh, uh, what is the quantities which you'll have to uh, produce and market. So this, this is how you look at the demand. So once you have a demand like this, uh, then you can look at the production plan or the capacities, what you have. So this is a starting point, uh, which is very, very important. Yeah, it's like some, someone wants to. Yeah, so we have a question here in the Please. chat box. Uh, chat box, uh, I just wanted to check uh, how to open that, but I'm not able to. Ah, uh, yeah, right, fine. I can read out that question. Yeah, no, I got it now. Oh, okay, fine. Uh, yeah, uptime, I think this is already done. Uh, all right. So this demand, uh, this demand forecast will give uh, by sales department or production department. Yes, exactly. So that's what I was trying to say. So basically the, uh, the sales department or the marketing department gives the demand forecast. But when you calculate the plan, you can also, I, they also have to look at the past data, like I said here, you look at the data, but if you have a sales department, they look at the, what they, they are planning to sell in the coming uh, months. And then they give the data to the uh, production department for that plan. Forecast uh, production department is normally not involved in a forecast uh, activity because they are not in touch with the customer. So the sales department or the marketing department or business development department, whichever way you call it, those are the guys who are in touch with customers on a regular basis. And then so, uh, it also depends on the uh, owner of the company. Sometimes the owner himself is involved in looking uh, at the future. And then uh, you have, if you if you forecast is not very high, still you want to uh, look at some other uh, areas where you can sell your products. Then the the MD of the company or the owner of the company can say you plan for this. So that the ultimate uh, uh, decision is by the management, top management team, which will uh, decide this forecast based on the sales department's uh, numbers and their own uh, analysis of the situation. Okay. You have the demand forecast, uh, then you have to evaluate the current capacity. So now current capacities, as I uh, earlier said, you'll have to calculate the capacities based on your cycle times. So how do you do that? Now, current capacity in-house processes, first let us see. So you will have to have the uh, machine cycle times, as I earlier mentioned. You need to have a record of the machine cycle times. What is the current cycle time? And then you also have to look at the uh, upkeep, as I said, uptime, uh, uh, considering the various factors, so 85%, 90%, etc. So based on that, you can have a current capacity, uh, you, you calculate that. So, and then you have first the cycle times. And then, as I, as I uh, given here, so the, see, output per hour is normally, suppose, for example, you have a process here, stamping one, welding one, welding two, assembly one, assembly two. These are the different processes in a particular product, for example, and these are the cycle time in seconds. 
of course there could be cycle time in minutes or hours also in some of your products but i am just giving an example here so the output per hour for this assembly one process is 3600 seconds by 65 so it will be this long output per shift say for example you run 8 hours uh, so you have to decide on working hours uh, uh, per shift what is uh, your output uh, what is your shift time and then what is your number of days working so based on the calculated for example uh, let me go into this so first i will go through this machine capacity is based on machine cycle times Assembly capacity will be based on manual operations. If it is a manual, assuming it's a, it's a manual operation, uh, you will have to calculate the manual operation times and then uh, calculate the capacity of assembly operation. Now, labor capacity is based on cycle times of manual operations, machines, and assembly lines. So these are the, the see at each stage of the manual operation, you have to look at the cycle times there. And then calculate the capacities, and then you you have to identify what is the number of resources you require, manpower resources you have to uh, you need for that particular operation for that particular quantity. Now you have to when you are calculating the capacity, first step is to decide on the working hours per shift. It could be eight hours, it could be eight. Hours. So without uh, the lunch time, so you, when you say eight hours, suppose you have eight hours, and then you have a half an hour lunch break within that, and then you have some fifteen minutes break, then you have to remove all that, and then what is the working hours per shift? You will have to calculate that. <coughs> Based on that, you will have to calculate the capacity. So if it is 8 hours and 30, 30, hours, 30 minutes is for one uh, lunch time and 15 minutes two, two breaks, then it is one hour gone. So 7 hours only is the available time for you. So the available time per shift, you will have to decide. I mean, the management decides this. And then based on that, you will have to calculate. Now, number of shifts per day. Are you working one shift per day? Or are you working two shifts per day? Or are you working three shifts per day? Depends. So, so a good practice would be to work not more than two shifts. I mean, generally, good companies, what they do, uh, even if they need the third shift, they don't plan their capacities on a uh, three shift basis. Sometimes they may be forced to work on three shifts because of, uh, say, some issues in breakdown or machines uh, availability and all that, or suddenly a demand has uh, propped up and they are not able to meet in two shifts. So they run the third shift to meet the demand till the new uh, machines or new facilities have been ordered and they, are, they have been received. You might have to run three shifts per day, but generally a good practice is to uh, aim for uh, two shift working maximum and then leave the third shift for any exigencies so that you have, even if you have some problems, you work on the third shift for, say, for a few hours and then uh, make up the shortfall of the day. So, so if these are things which uh, normally uh, are applicable for uh, uh, kind of mass production uh, kind of manufacturing. May not be applicable for you, I am not very sure, but uh, still uh, I would like to uh, uh, point out these uh, concepts so that you can have an idea of uh, what exactly is the uh, Way the capacities are calculated. So you have to decide the number of shifts per day and then the number of days per month, whether you're working five days a week or six days a week, depends on the management. And then once you do that, you will have to have whether it's 25 days a uh, month or uh, uh, 26 days per month, you will have to take care of that and then calculate. So for example, here, 65 seconds, this assembly time I said, uh, output per hour will be 3600 by 65. And then output per shift of eight hours would be four. Considering eight hours availability, this is four forty output per month at two twenty five days per month will be this much. So you take an efficiency of eighty percent. You sorry, I'm I think I missed it here. So you calculate that that uh, it should be eight thousand eight hundred or something. Okay. I have a question so, here. Yeah, please. In this, um, let's say the time taken for inspection or quality check is also included as a part of the cycle time somewhere. Yeah, exactly. If if the operator is doing it, if the operator is doing the checking, then it goes into his manual time. So when in a particular process, suppose his his job is to load, unload, and then when the machine is running, he takes the earlier completed job, for example, before giving it to the next stage, he inspects it, or he uh, there are some gauges available. So all this inspection time will go into his manual time. As long as it doesn't, as long as the manual time involved is less than your machine time, your capacity will not get affected. But your number of manpower might get affected based on that. So you'll have to calculate the machine time separately, the manual time separately in each process. And then when you have a, a sequence of operations or a sequence of machines uh, running, 
you might have to balance the two three machines with one of you can do that actually when the machine type line is high one operator can run two to three machines maybe so that's how cells are formed normally so when you talk about cell manufacturing i can explain better so what you what will have is a man a man if he has got time he can do the other operations but there could be some operations like assembly where it is purely manual function so the the operator does the loading and loading and he does again the manual processing he inspects it he cleans it and then passes on to the next then the entire cycle time will get added i mean his inspection time and this this all this time will get added into his manual time that will decide the shift uh, the, the output of that particular process definitely it will affect the process it will it has to get added in the manual times if it is going to be an automated inspection process then it goes to cycle time of that machine which is used for the inspection so suppose it could be a different machine you do load it into that and that inspects so the machine time then you need to calculate the capacity of that particular machine also so everything has to be monitored calculated and estimated for your capacity purposes okay thank you now a few uh, uh, formulae which uh, normally are used uh, in the manufacturing industry so there are these are all used for the calculation of the uh, capacities and then how to plan so line rate is what normally they call it could be the customer it is generally the customer expected demand by the number of working days for, for example a month example a special product line we are anticipating an average monthly demand of 8000 units our normal production of the month is 20 days month of production for example five day week so your line rate will be 400 units per day this is your uh, rate per day what is you need to produce to meet your customer demand. so when you now pack time so this is a very important term which you might have heard which is uh, widely used and which is very very critical for your uh, capacity enhancement or your capacity planning uh, or any improvement in uh, manufacturing pack time is very important it is actually the targeted cycle time at which your process should run to meet your demand of customer so this is generally the definition so here so working minutes per day by the line rate this is what is your time time so suppose we operate this line two shifts the same line two shifts everyone clocks in 8.5 hours per shift as i said each shift gets two 15 minute breaks one 30 minute break per lunch each shift is allowed 15 minutes for meetings and clean up this is clean up of machines and per whatever it is so the working minutes would be two shifts so into each shift 8.5 into 60 minutes minus 2 into 15 minute breaks one 30 minute break one 15 minute break so finally it comes to 870 minutes per day your asking rate is 500 400 units per day so 870 minutes divided by 400 2.2 this is your targeted cycle length pack time for that particular product for that particular line is 2.2 minutes am i clear or you what to explain here because this is a very critical uh, uh, calculation which normally everybody does in uh, manufacturing industry which is which is which will actually guide you in your uh, capacity planning process <laughs> like what maybe you can also uh, discuss later on more these are some of the uh, ma target manning as i said manpower also you need to calculate so what is your work content suppose for example your average human work content for this product for is 15 minutes the entire process takes 15 minutes for that line and then your manning is 15 minutes divided by 2.2 minutes 2.2 is your pack time so every 2.2 minutes you need one output so 15 minutes divided by the 2.2 minutes will be 1.1 into 1.1 is factor for 15 minutes labor factor you will get around eight operators you need for running this line this is how your manpower is calculated for so when you calculate the work content all this inspection loading and loading cleaning whatever you are asking something back i think that should get added here in calculating the manpower required for the particular line <coughs> so these are the two things which uh, which are very important uh, the track time and then the manning uh, target manning which uh, are used to calculate the uh, track time and then the manning uh, number of people required to run the line or the machine which are okay so there there are other uh, efficiency uh, performance uh, measurement techniques that are manufacturing cycle time uh, a work content ratio so work content ratio is actually the value added time uh, see normally in any line or any uh, company you find that every stage you have some value addition time for example 
<coughs> you you have a cycle time of say 10 minutes or 15 minutes or whatever. But at the end of the line, whenever the product is going out of the factory, the whole cycle time which is taken into the uh, process, the process of building one product will be much, much higher than what is the cycle, actual cycle time required to make that product. That's how it is uh, generally. So value added ratio is normally not exceeding 50%, which are best companies like Toyota. Companies like other companies, normal companies will have 10%, 20%, 30%, depending on the product factor. So, so how it is calculated is what is the WIP, the inventory of this control part divided by exit rate. So these are the this is 3.75 days is what you get for uh, the cycle time as a cycle time for this particular example. So four days it takes for one product from starting to the ending. That, that's the meaning of this uh, uh, measurement. We can look at it later on. It's, you, you don't need to get uh, worried about this uh, performance measurement now. Uh, once you do the entire line processing and then improvement, and then we can look at this. When you do look at, say, uh, good manufacturing techniques like lean manufacturing and all that, this these performance measurements will be useful uh, to follow. Work content ratio would be the, uh, say for example, the total work content is 15 minutes. The work content involving the steps is 10 minutes, which is the critical part. So the 10 minutes, so divided by 3.75 days into 17 hours. So it, it's 0.25%. Work content ratio. That means any com any product for making it takes three point seven five days, but actually the cycle time which should which is required to make the product is only point two five percent of that. So that's the meaning of this. So we have a lot of waste in the process uh, flow. That is the summary of this uh, uh, measurement, which we can look at uh, later on. First we do the capacity planning, production planning, and then we look at uh, these things. Now, when you look at capacity enhancement, how do what are the things which are involved in this? So, identification of the bottleneck uh, in those process machine man. As I said, you calculate the track time for that particular part or product for the uh, for that process, uh, considering the uh, demand. And then you look at the cycle times. Uh, you calculate the cycle times for each process, as uh, explained earlier. And then you identify the bottleneck. In the earlier example, 65 seconds was the highest cycle time. So that, that should be the, for example, which are the highest cycle time process, that is the bottleneck process in the house process. So that is the bottleneck in those process, which has to be ramped up uh, if you need to uh, meet the track time of the particular product. Estimation of current capacity, bought out. So we have seen the in-house process capacities. Now we also have to look at the uh, outside uh, parts, like where we are fully buying some pro fully bought parts from the suppliers or subcontractors. So you need to have the capacities of each supplier, subcontractor. You have to talk to them. So this is normally done by the purchase department. You have a purchase department. You generally companies have a purchase department or a vendor improvement team or whatever way you call it, uh, or a sourcing, uh, strategic sourcing team. So these, this department, uh, looks at the supplier or a subcontractor, they visit them, they look at all his uh, capacities part-wise and then have a, uh, you need to have a, a list of uh, uh, capacity, uh, current capacities of each supplier, each subcontractor, vendor-wise, because some of the components you might have, you might be buying from two, three vendors also. So when you do that, Vendor-wise, you need to have. So normally, strategically, companies, what they do is you don't buy from a single supplier. So you buy from two suppliers as, because as a contingency. Suppose he goes under breakdown, company gets shut down. So you still have another vendor who can supply you the parts. So this is what is uh, contingency planning. So you generally, two to three vendors or suppliers are identified for each part when you are buying some parts outside. <clears throat> and then you decide on the ratio of which on which uh, basis you are going to order the material. For example, one vendor A could be given 60% of the orders or the, or the quantity. Vendor B could be 40 percent Based on things like uh, the quality uh, requirements, the delivery uh, performance of the supplier, the cost of the part, because all vendors may not be charging the same. For the same item, say ordering, one person may give one rupee, another person may give 1.5 rupees. So, depends. But if the quality also is good, then the lower cost person you can select. And then the delivery. Customers, normally vendors, they accept uh, the uh, orders uh, to give, say, every day, say, 200 numbers or 300 numbers, whatever is you're asking. But the delivery performance will be very bad. 
so they it could be 60% 70% so you also need to monitor this so each supplier what is his delivery performance level so this is done again by the sourcing team so they have a <coughs> they have an idea which source uh, which source or the vendor uh, is uh, delivering at what uh, performance level so considering that also so even if uh, he has got a capacity of say 1000 rupees he says but he is at only 70% then you can take a capacity of only 700 from that supplier. So that's how the capacities of the vendors or the suppliers also have to be listed out and uh, monitored uh, and uh, checked for the uh, capacity planning. So you have to identify the suppliers who are needing the uh, capacity enhancement because sometimes uh, uh, they may be uh, short of capacity. There is another big uh, estimation which you need to do when you are doing a capacity enhancement, which is the land and building requirement. So because normally when you, when you start with, you might have a shed or you might have a factory, you might have a land, uh, but it might not be sufficient for considering the, your production plan or your capacity enhancement plan. So what you need to do is you have to have a, prepare a line layout of process wise. You prepare a plant layout considering number of regions required, assembly lines required, office requirement, stores area, Unit the area required, such as captive power. Suppose you are planning for a captive power, UG set, air compressor, etc. So, all these things have to be considered, and then you need to make a plant layout, considering again, as I said, the future plan. And then you estimate the building area required, considering some future requirement also. One thing is building area. If you are going up, first floor, second floor, it could be possible. It is possible. So, maybe you can consider that. So the total area required for all these offices and uh, offices, basically, you can uh, get some, because some of the companies I have seen when I was in recall in Kuala So even the assembly lines we were having in uh, RCC buildings, concrete floors, it was, not, it was not a fabricated shell. <laughs> so uh, it's possible to have assembly lines also in uh, concrete buildings. May not be a shell, but it depends on company to company. It will vary which uh, management. Uh, the working style could be different, their thinking could be different. There are different ways of looking at it. RCC building could be costlier, shell could be cheaper. Uh, but RCC building, you might it might be easy to have some uh, air control measures and uh, AC and all that. So it all depends. And I mean, you can go higher floors also. Whereas a shed, you cannot, uh, you can have it, you can only expand horizontally, you cannot expand vertically. Depends on the uh, area requirement and the location of your factory. It could be in some limits where the people don't, I mean, the government doesn't uh, allow you, there could be some statutory requirements, all that. So, so considering all this, you have to estimate building area, you have to decide what kind of a building you want to have for a factory. Once your building is decided, then you estimate the land requirement, considering again the statutory requirements. There are some uh, rules and regulations of the government. This much building area is only possible in a particular land area. So you move on that. So. Uh, FSI and FARs and all that you must be. So <laughs> you need to uh, estimate the land required based on above. Also keeping in view the legal and statutory requirements. Also, you might be looking at, uh, see when it comes to land, you will always think about uh, the future, maybe two years, three years down the line. So you don't, or five years also sometimes. Because land, is, it is appreciating, going on appreciating. And you might be uh, required to buy a land now. And then you might decide to buy a land but not construct a building. So you can have a smaller building to begin with. And later on, you can uh, uh, build more buildings or add uh, to the building, etc., or go to uh, upper above floors as an unrequired. So, but land requirement could be something which is, you might be thinking of future uh, for deciding uh, to, to uh, buy a land. So these are the things which you need to consider. Maybe the uh, land House capacity building now, when it comes to process capacity building, what are the things you consider now? So these are some things which I think somebody also uh, raised a question. You, the first thing is you improve the processes. So current processes, whether you can reduce the cycle time by using appropriate tools, like say, for example, cutting tool improvement, fixtures improvement, or <coughs> uh, labor, uh, manual time, uh, manual process improvement. Machine efficiency improvement. See, so as I said earlier, the efficiency of the machine could be now 65%, 70%. How to improve that to say 85, 90% at least? So uh, there are some things which uh, you will have to look at first. 
because immediately you cannot look at uh, uh, buying some new facility, new capital equipment. So that is again an investment. Before going for a fresh investment, normally the practice is to look at how to improve the current processes, reduce the cycle times, like whichever way. As I said, tooling improvement, process improvement. Sometimes it could be change of process also. So, say for example, you are doing a particular kind of machining process. Instead of that, you do another kind of machining process, which is maybe a cycle time you do, or some other process itself. Instead of machining, you do something else. So, these are things which you, your process engineering team has to work on uh, how to improve your cycle times to meet the uh, track time. Uh, based on the process. It could be different from process to process. Another big uh, uh, area which you can work on is the rejections and the reworks. Generally, we have a lot of rejections and rework in our lines. Any company has it, so it's not that it's something uh, unusual. Uh, so once you say, suppose there's a 10% rejection, the 10% the straight away value added uh, product uh, gone to rejection. So it's a waste. So 10% capacity is gone. So the best uh, way, uh, easiest way is to improve the rejections, provided you do an analysis. Again, here there is a cross-functional team approach which will help the production team, the quality team and the production engineering team uh, or the process engineering, whichever way you call it. So these three departments at least uh, can uh, do uh, uh, analysis of the rejections, the last week rejections or yesterday's rejections. It depends, different companies have got different uh, methodology. So they do the analysis of all the rejections and also the rework. So rework also is costly because uh, you might salvage the product, but you are spending some time and effort on that. It adds to the cost. So all this analysis is done by the uh, cross-functional team. And then uh, you look at uh, improving the process uh, by way of say automation or improvements in the process or rectifying some machines or in training some of the your skilled in our They may be skilled, but still there could be some skills uh, missing. Uh, these things, or you can also uh, do some mistake proofings in the line. So there are some things which, uh, which is called as, I mean, you, you might have heard, OPIOK is one term which is very frequently used uh, in quality management. It is nothing but a mistake proofing uh, tool. So you build in your process some mistake proofing process that so that you don't end up in a rejection or a reward. And then uh, there's another way of doing the uh, improvement, which is balancing the line where required by redistributing the processes across the machines and workers. Suppose a particular part goes into machine A and machine B. Machine A takes say 60 seconds, machine B takes 40 seconds. 60 of the some of the operations of A could be transferred to maybe B so that it becomes 50 each. So these are some of the things which uh, you can look at some of redistributing the processes, provided it is possible. Of course, every machine may not be possible. It may not be possible to do every process in every machine. But this analysis and uh, uh, and study needs to be done by the engineering team, the process uh, production engineering team, and the production team, so that you balance the line and get down the cycle time in the bottleneck cycle time. It is the same way in the in the assembly line also. You do this uh, balancing of the line. So, for example, operator A takes more time, operator B takes less time. So, you distribute the process uh, processes amongst the operators so that the uh, the the bottleneck cycle time or the net cycle time output uh, uh, is improved. Cycle time is reduced and your uh, output increases. So, this is how balancing is done between the machines and also between the work persons. Uh, so these are the things which uh, you need to take care. Then sometimes what happens is the man just by adding manpower, you might be uh, able to expand your capacity or increase your capacity because a machine could be taking less time, whereas a man uh, could be taking more time. So in that case, the man is deciding the output of the machine. So what happens is the machine could be costly. So there's no point in investing in another machine just by adding a, a work person. You might be distributing the workload and then you get the cycle time of the net cycle time lower so that you get the so these are this is very common for uh, a cell type of uh, working uh, even in assembly lines or in uh, machine cycles and machine cells also machining cells also so when you add work persons the total uh, uh, cycle time comes down uh, uh, to the uh, lesser than the machine time so machine becomes the bottleneck so normally people would 
prefer the machine to be the bottleneck when, when in, in, in any uh, uh, setup where there is a machine and a man. If it's fully manual operation, then the man is himself is the bottleneck. But in cases of cells or assembly cells or machining cells where you have uh, both machines as well as uh, manpower working on that. So normally the machines are costlier. So generally capital equipment involved. So machines could be should be the uh, bottleneck and not the manpower. So manpower. So, so this is the current situation in India, but it could be different <laughs> because in uh, uh, in countries like Europe or uh, US, maybe it's, it's a different op uh, option for them. Uh, they could uh, add machines and then. Uh, they don't maybe add uh, work persons for that. So there are other issues involved in country to country. But in our country, I think as of now, as of, as much uh, to my knowledge, I think it is uh, easier to add work people and uh, than the machines. So because machines are costlier in the region. No, after exhausting all these other options, as I said, cycle time reduction, processing, and rejections, rework improvement, balancing of line, work persons addition, they were required. So when you do all this, even after doing all this, exhausting all the above, all the things, you still, you are not able to get to your capacity. Then only you need to do the addition of machines. So if and when required, you add machines. But here again, there is a something. You, you also have to need, need to look at your demand. If the machines are very costly, you might add the shifts of, as I said, you might have add the man hours also, I mean, the uh, working hours also. Uh, if, if available and if you are able to do it. Or you can do an analysis of the outsourcing versus in-house manufacturing and uh, take make or buy decisions. The last point what I'm saying here. So suppose the it is uh, economical to do the part outside, uh, you can still outsource it. So, so that uh, in-house manufacturing cost is uh, saved. You only give it to a vendor. Who is already capable of doing this? Then you can shift some of the processes to the vendor. So he can do it. So outsourcing is also one area uh, or one option for you to increase the capacities. Or, but again, it, it depends case to case. Sometimes what happens is the costs are not uh, really uh, different from outsourcing into your house, and then you 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 have to give a profit to the vendor. So it might. Uh, end up uh, with a higher cost. So what happens is <coughs> you you might not do an outsourcing. You might decide to do in-house itself. For example, all the machining, generally wherever there is a, not much of value addition. Uh, so if there's a value addition, then it's okay when you are adding some uh, value. Otherwise, there is no point in uh, doing this option, taking off this option. So you need to take a make or buy decision depending on the particular uh, uh, costs involved and the uh, vendor's availability and uh, what is your strategic uh, plan strategy because some operations you might not want to outsource for example outsourcing operations not core to the organization you can do outsourcing but if it is uh, core to the operation of your operation then you might not uh, uh, decide to uh, do the operations at a vendor end because that is not uh, their core of operation their core operation it could be your core operation and you don't want to i mean you are better suited to uh, do those operations uh, uh, to get a better output and a better quality. So these are some of the uh, uh, points or uh, to be taken care of on the, the processes which are involved in the uh, capacity. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, yeah, so I have a question here, not yeah. very much relevant to it, but. Um, so in my understanding, so in the process, a good part of it is taken by the machines and its efficiency and the capacity it can produce, right? So yeah. I was just thinking that um, uh, as like most of them are startups and initially like they don't have, uh, they may not have uh, you know, the capacity to do huge investment for machines. So right. if they are going for it and uh, what are the things they need to keep in mind? And another thing is that uh, most of our oh, startups, I, I, they are having a huge social responsibility. They really want to uh, give employment to other people also. They may not even want to you know, fully automate their entire process. Few things they might automate, few things, you know, they want, yeah. to, they want to involve people. Um, so like, how do they decide that process? Like, how can they plan it efficiently? 
And that's what I said. As you, if you are, don't want to add machines, you can add manpower and do it as a, if it is possible. But if it's a machine dependent time and uh, if a machine has to do the entire op operations, then you'll have to remove some of the operations from the machine. If you want to give manpower uh, uh, some uh, employment, then you'll have to remove some of the operations which are done by the machine and then do it with a man. But there is again, there is a uh, balancing which uh, an optimization which needs to be done because see normally automation is done not only for uh, not basically I mean today professional companies don't do it for removal of manpower basically the idea would be to get a better output of the uh, product or the process I mean the quality wise so automation gives a better quality that's the basic uh, thing which people tend to uh, follow so they don't sometimes they may be doing it for um, uh, for, for example, uh, the machines are already available and then they do it. So well, they don't have excess manpower, then they do the automation. But if you have manpower and still you want to use the manpower, you are very well uh, free to do it. But you need to train your manpower with appropriate skills so that they don't do a mistake in doing the process. So for that, what all need to be done? You have to document. I mean, when you are when it is more manual operated operations, then you need to have the skills training. And then you will have to have a clear work instructions for them how to go about it could be not only in written form it could be in visual form so there could be some uh, visual uh, uh, graphically depicted uh, work instructions which are the things which the operator needs to take care while doing this process what are the outputs uh, he has to check what are the visual points which he has to take care those things have to be taken care of when you are uh, concentrating more on the manual operations so if you don't want to do uh, automation fine that's okay but you need to build your quality in the manual operations also. That's my point, what I'm saying. I am not saying that you, you should always automate. So automation is may be required where it is uh, very difficult to control the process quality by the operator. So then maybe you may do it. And even then, it may not be a big uh, kind of a costly machine. It could be a low cost machine. It could be a low cost automation. Normally, people look at low cost automation, automation options nowadays. Uh, so it's not a very high cost uh, equipment. But as you rightly said, these uh, startups uh, uh, have a responsibility or they feel a responsibility to uh, give employment to people. It's fine. That's good. So you don't need to add machines. You only need to add the manual operations by adding manpower. So it's always possible. So, but again, the, the other flip side of it is the quality which they need to ensure. So if you are able to take care of that, then it should not be a problem. So they can train the operators have some good work instructions for them to follow and then uh, review the process uh, on a regular basis uh, and uh, still uh, keep it as a manual operation that's fine yes yeah, so, uh, like the first part of the question like what are the things they need to keep in mind before they invest in some machines is it like the efficiency or maybe you know, cost might be very high. They may not be exactly. able. Exactly, exactly. That's what I said. So the costs, uh, if the machine is uh, exorbitantly costly, then they'll have to think about it. So there are, but today there are lots of uh, domestically manufactured machines. If you go for an import, definitely uh, the cost will be very high. But when you have to uh, uh, buy a machine, you can look at uh, domestic suppliers who are uh, doing the same. Uh, quality uh, machine one then you don't need to go for a very high cost machine you can go for low cost machines uh, considering the uh, capability of the machine for example the, the cycle times the output so, see sometimes what happens is the machine poster machine may be giving you a very uh, low cycle time but whereas a low cost machine could be, could be giving you a higher cycle time but still because you cannot invest in that you can still look at uh, these uh, low cost machines and then uh, go for it provided they are able to give the process quality uh, as designed by you so these are the things so when when machine uh, when you are procuring there are lots of things which you need to take care uh, for example the, the serviceability i mean service capability of the supplier if the supplier is able to give you a good quality service after sales is what i mean if a machine goes under breakdown then he has to maybe uh, attend properly you have to train your maintenance department to uh, take care of the machine, you have to get them trained at the supplier end uh, so that 
your people can take care of the breakdowns on their own rather than depending on the supplier. So these things are some of the things which you have to uh, uh, take care. And also the quality output of the component of the product from this machine. What are the um, mistake proofing you need to do in the machine? What are the other uh, uh, process control parameters? There are some process control uh, parameters or characteristics, uh, significant process characteristics. Right? You will have to uh, build in that machine or ensure that it is followed by the operator. For example, some temperature or whatever it is, cycle times, I mean, speeds, speeds involved in the process. So these things have to be uh, built into your process control plan, which the operator has to follow when using these machines. So these are some things which uh, can be taken care of uh, when you go for a low cost machine and uh, you still get your output uh, properly. And then maintenance and service is one. Space cost is another thing because some of the machines uh, uh, space uh, uh, should not be very high. Uh, I, um, the cost of the space should not be very high. So, so the local, uh, local suppliers, it's better always to uh, buy for uh, such uh, uh, for the space cost to be low, one. And then when you have already a machine, uh, if you're buying another machine with a different uh, kind of setup, then you need to have space for this also, for this also. So as long as possible, as far as possible, you have a uh, common uh, uh, spare items list so that the machines will be similar to each other. And then you can, one of the components goes on one machine, you can still use the other machine. Uh, components for uh, spare components. So you can have common space for the machine. So these are some things which you need to take care of when you are deciding on the machine where you are uh, going to buy. But of course, the service portion and the uh, availability of space from the customer, from the supplier, sorry, and then your people uh, capability to maintain the machines. These are things which you, you need to take care of when uh, deciding on the machine to be bought. So. Uh, of course, cycle time is uh, and quality output is uh, given, but then when you are going for a low cost machine, these things how do you take care in your process. So you have to build in your process uh, the parameters and the output checking by the operator. These things which uh, will, which will ensure that uh, the output uh, uh, from these machines are also fairly good. So if, if you are not able to invest in machines, then there is another option. As I said, if it is not a core option, core operation, you can buy it from outside. I mean, you can buy the components from outside. You don't want to add machines. You only have to do some uh, manual operations. That's fine. So it, it all depends case to case on a particular. Uh, uh, it varies from company to some company to company, and the strategy of the management uh, has to what strategy they want to follow. So it all depends on it. So if you want to have still manual operations, that's fine. Uh, you want to give employment to somebody, you can still have because these. Uh, uh, Startups, as you like said, they might uh, not want to invest in high cost machines. That's that's okay. Okay. Yeah, if any of you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Yeah, yeah, please, please. At the end of the session, also we can ask. Yeah. Now, when it comes to uh, building capacity for uh, auto parts, now we'll have to also have a look at the uh, capacity of our vendors for all of the auto parts. So, so normally what uh, good companies do is you assist your vendor in improving the process first. Again, so similar process what we undertook uh, uh, for our in-house. So you also, maybe you go to the vendor end if possible, if you have a team of uh, people who can do that. So you assist your vendor. Uh, you study the process and you can give some suggestions. Or if he is having the core competency, then he has to improve his processes. Uh, that's how it goes. And then he, uh, again, the reduce the cycle time for using the appropriate service. So the, the same things which are uh, so add. Uh, now you also uh, after doing again the cycle time improvement suggestions and all that. If you still feel that the existing vendor cannot add capacity by process improvement. Uh, or additional facilities, then you add some new vendors or let him add uh, his capacity. So if he's, if he's able to add some facility and then uh, expand his uh, production rate or capacity, then it's fine. But if he's not still able to do, like, uh, like we said, we don't want to invest in machines. Right now, we are not in a position to um, uh, buy a new machine or add a new machine uh, as it's a capital investment. Then what you do is, suppose he's, he can take such a decision, then at, at that time, you need to look at new vendors. So suppose existing vendors are not adequate, you look at uh, the new vendors. Uh, this could be actually two ways. One is the 
production quantity wise they are not able to meet your uh, requirements is one thing but there is another uh, possibility also they are giving you quantity but the quality is not okay so whatever they supply uh, may not be uh, acceptable to you or there could be several rejections in that uh, so uh, net capacity uh, is lower than what he is uh, claiming so even then you will have to uh, have a new vendor or you have to look for a new vendor uh, to uh, meet your uh, water uh, parts capacity so nobody um, <clears throat> has been asking questions so just wanted to take a Pause here, check with them if um, the pace is okay. Um, you find it useful. Anybody could uh, give a feedback? Yeah, on one one they will. Yeah, Ashwini, Amrita. Yeah, Ankur. the pace is fine. We are understanding and uh, yeah, like few things noted down as well. Good, good, good. Oh, great. That's that's yeah. good to hear. But still, we, we can always have a, a, at the end of the session or uh, during our one-on-one -on -one session uh, if you have more doubts. But anytime, don't uh, uh, feel uh, you just stop me wherever you want. Okay. Sure, sure. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, see, there are uh, uh, now when you you have, you'll have to draw a project plan when you have decided what you want. So you will have to have a, a development of a, a project plan for each product or item. Right? So Gantt charts are uh, generally used for development of a product. Uh, if they are made to order, I'll, I'll explain to you later what is this made to order kind of product. So it's uh, generally not made to stock. Make to order stock and make to order to kind of uh, products or a, a kind of business what uh, people say. Uh, so when you your products are as of now, I think they would be more of a make to order. So when you have an order, you get an order from the customer, maybe you manufacture that. So, so uh, such kind of products, uh, maybe you will have to have a, a development uh, plan. Uh, you can have a plan chart for that. So you review the project plan on a daily basis or a weekly or monthly basis, depending on the product and the uh, team, what you have. Management also have to review uh, on an agreed frequency, say weekly or sometimes uh, uh, they do it on a daily basis or alternate day also. People go to the GAN charts and then see if the new issues are there. If any support is required for the team who is uh, uh, on the uh, who are responsible for the development of the product, project. So, uh, uh, the frequent interactions with the team would uh, help them understand uh, the necessities and uh, provide the quiet support to the uh, team members so that you achieve the plan uh, based on the uh, on the, uh, the target uh, mandates. So the, the project plan would be normally to start from the launch state of the product order and include the design stage, purchase, manufacturing, assembly, trials, and dispatch of them. So this could be a broad project plan which uh, which I'll show you an example of a, uh, a project plan summary. So it's, see, this, this is just a summary of a project plan. So these are activities here. So once you finalize the order from the customer, an order of finalization by customer, so it's done. So you have done on this week one. Week or it could be day or it could be a month also, depending on how you are following the project plan or how you are preparing the project plan. Generally, it could be the uh, plan and actual dates. I'll give you another example. This is just a, a schematic uh, uh, of the project plan I'm giving you now. So you do the, you, you write like this, you order, order finalization with the customer. So this is the first act. Then customer has to give you some design inputs. So he gives you inputs for the design. Then you do the design. If it's a die, you die. If it's a harvester or whatever you're saying, it's a design. So it's your own design, then you don't have this design input. You, this, this activity may not be there. But once you receive an order, you just go into your design. But if it is already a established product and uh, you don't have any design to do for each time, then this design activity also may not be there. Just releasing for manufacturing could be the activity. So it depends on the project or the product what uh, we are looking at. So this is more of a, a, a die which is uh, made to an order. So every order would be a different uh, uh, product. So that's the reason this is added here in this example. So this could be different for uh, your kind of products, some of your kind of products at least. 
So die design, die uh, design approved by the customer. So again, normally a customer has to approve our design. So even in uh, special purpose machines manufacturing, you see, you you make your design and then you send it to your customer and then he approves it. That's how. The, uh, it is normally done in machine tools because I was earlier in the machine tool company HMB. So this is how it is done. Then raw material. Sometimes the raw material uh, is decided by us, but customer has to approve that. Especially in die design, this is uh, an important factor. So for your uh, products or projects, it could be different. Then material procurement. This is done by purchase department. So what, when is that like that? Then the die manufacturing. So production and assembly will take so much time. Then the trials. Once everything is done, assembly is done. Then you do a trial of the uh, product. So it could be uh, a die casting machine or a, whatever. So for your product, what, what kind of trials do you do? So sometimes, for example, a two wheeler, they have a test track. So they go onto the test track and then test the vehicle whether it's fine or not. So this is after the SOP is done. So in fact, all the uh, inspection and process inspection, uh, when I come to quality control, I will explain. But generally, they are done in, at each process. So even at the end of the assembly stage, there is an inspection process, there is a testing process. All that is done. But still, uh, at the end of this, there is good, there could be a final trial, uh, depending on your project. So uh, like a two-wheeler, you have to take a test drive. So for your components, maybe your products will be different. And then if there is any problem in this trial, then you do a correction. And then again, this is done by the production assembly team. So they, they do the correction of the product and then they redo the assembly and then retry it. So once all this is done and it is fine, then you have to dispatch the product. So this is a broad schematic of a uh, project plan. Uh, this is for a die, for example, uh, which, is, uh, uh, which is made based on an order. Every order is different. So every product is, could be different. So there could be similarities between the other products, but generally, uh, it is not a standard product. So that's how it is. So, so for example, this is a, is a live example. I have given a similar product. I'm just saying how it looks like. So for example, all the description of the activities are given here, description, project plan, rough model, etc. There are two rows here, plan and action. Plan and action. So blue is for plan. Uh, different colors are used uh, uh, for actions. If it is done on time, it is green. If it is not done on time, it could be yellow or uh, orange or red or whatever it is. So whichever, uh, you need to have a legend for this. So uh, the dates could be different. So sometimes what happens is the plan itself could be revised. So you might have a different date. After. So the, here it's the, the top of the column, it's, it's all dates. For example, here if you see September, the dates are given. So it need not be weeks, it could be exact date on which it has to be completed. So this activity has to take place from 9th to uh, say 13th. So this activity has to be completed from this tools. There could be some parallel activities. There could be some sequential activities. It depends. So some of the activities are related to each other. So you cannot start another activity if the earlier activity is not done. So when the plan is prepared by the team, so those things have to be taken into account. And then uh, the plan prepared, uh, considering some uh, exigencies also. There could be some plans here and there, one or two days extra you might give, depending on the uh, uh, particular activity, how much time it takes. So th this is how a uh, plan is made and this is reviewed. This is displayed in the planning room normally and then reviewed by the top management. It is first reviewed by the uh, whoever is uh, responsible for this activity, uh, like uh, all the teams, team members could be uh, reviewed. Example, the design department, purchase department, uh, manufacturing department, each manufacturing stage, uh, the trial department, everybody. So whoever is uh, involved in this, uh, they actually update this uh, status of this. So the head of the operations or uh, generally would uh, uh, review this in the planning room and there could be a morning meeting every day and then uh, they, they, they review this activity whether it is done or not. So uh, unless it is done on a daily basis or at least alternate day, so there could be slip ups in this and then there could be, because sometimes they may be needing some support of the management for uh, uh, completing the activity, there could be some uh, issues in the machines, it could be some issues in manpower, whatever it is. So this entire thing is reviewed by the head of operations generally, uh, who is responsible for manufacturing of this on a, at least on an alternate day basis. And then uh, weekly, maybe once the next level management, top management could be reviewed. So this is a good uh, way of reviewing the entire uh, project. The same Gantt chart can be used for any uh, purpose. Uh, this is more of a uh, project-oriented uh, product uh, 
uh, this is what is like practical. If it's a mass production kind of a process, uh, then this may not be, uh, this may be applicable only for a development project. For example, a new product you are developing. So at that time, you may have to uh, start like this, development, uh, prototype building, uh, design uh, verification, design validation. So that's a new product development uh, can start. But for mass production, which is more of a, if it's a standard product, you only have to give components uh, and uh, parts to be arranged. So uh, this kind of a Gantt chart may not be really applicable there. So it could be more of a component availability for each uh, product which you are reviewing. So it could be different for different uh, kind of uh, business. This is again the end of this. So till, till the customer approval and dispatch, it is uh, considered. Now, material planning is one thing which, which is very, very important, uh, which is where this MTO and MTS kind of thing is coming. So generally manufacturing is of uh, two types, two kinds or kind of business, they say. So this is M2 stock, uh, MTS is made to stock. This is used generally oh, okay. in the- uh, yeah. Sir, I'm really sorry to interrupt you. I have a question from the previous yeah, slide. Yes. Yeah. Um, so it's a very general question. So you have yeah. years of experience in different industry. Yeah. industry. So I would really like to know from the time, you know, an enterprise get an order from the customer and they do the dispatch. In the right. entire process, where exactly you have seen like most of the inefficiency happens, like most of the problems happen. At which, which stage, like uh, what is your experience? If it is, uh, there are uh, two, three areas where uh, these things happen. One is, uh, the first thing is once the order is given by the customer, the customer has to give some input. If it is a this kind of a product, okay, it may not be applicable to everybody in this group, but I'm just, because you asked the question, I'm just explaining to you. Uh, if this kind of a product where it is always made to a customer order, the first part where the first uh, stage where you you have some issues I have seen is the inputs from the customer. So normally you the customer gives you an order, you start working on it, and then but he has to give some inputs to you, uh, which could take some time. You will have to follow up with the customer. So you will have to be on a constant touch with the customer. The marketing team has to be in a constant touch with the customer and get those inputs for uh, for starting your design itself. Once the design is uh, inputs are received. You give you you make the design, and our design team is normally. I mean, I will assume that they are uh, generally uh, they don't have uh, too much of a delay in doing their activity because they normally manage uh, with some extra manpower if there's a problem or they they shuffle across the project. Suppose the one project is not uh, important, another project is important, so they normally shuffle the manpower and then try to uh, be on time for whichever project is uh, essential. After that, you give the design uh, back to customer for his approval. So that is again another stage which you, you find that there could be a delay from the customer. So of course, you cannot blame your customer for that. But I'm just saying there could be, these are things which you need to consider when you are making a plan. Uh, and there are some actions uh, to be taken by the teams uh, appropriately. For example, you have to go to the customer. Suppose you just write a mail and uh, keep quiet or talk to him. Sometimes uh, it might not work. So he will say, I'm giving, I'm giving, and then bye. So normally what happens is you allocate some uh, uh, one or two people who are uh, in the recent uh, day tech company also we did that. So we have it, uh, one or two guys who are uh, earmarked for uh, following up with customer. So they, they go to the customer for inputs also. They also take back uh, to the customer the design, go and sit with them get their approval if there are some issues because there is always some uh, lack of clarity between the customer and the, our department so it, it has to be resolved basically so unless you sit with each other and then uh, discuss and resolve it it will not happen so and because the once the if you are left alone you will get dragged into some other uh, activity some other project so customers are also like that we are also like that. so so normally what happens is you have to go to the customer, discuss with them, uh, try to understand uh, what are the issues in approving the design. So these are two areas from the customer end, which uh, one, and then there is another area from the customer end, which uh, you always find uh, there is some uh, delay or some issues is the final approval. So once you 
you give samples uh, for, for, for the product afterwards and then you you ask him for a, uh, to come for an inspection that could be something so there is again uh, an inspection activity by the customer and approval activity from at the towards the end of the project which there could be again a follow up period from our side some customers are good they they will be the gift so these are three areas of customer now coming to our stay in house uh, activities generally the design activity will not get uh, delayed per se i mean once the design input is given then the uh, delivery now there could be there are two three areas uh, of uh, uh, sources and uh, manufacturing in house manufacturing in house again as i said there could be issues we could have you know, we could have some issues of uh, quality <coughs> rework uh, these are things which uh, take place in our uh, in house activity so in house activity definitely there will be, there could be some delays there will be delays because it's a big activity and it's, it's it, uh, it goes to several weeks so there is always a like there is always a likelihood of again making up because sometimes what happens is even if you don't have in house capacity or your machines are a uh, problem normally what companies do is you outsource that activity you send your uh, part to for a vendor to do the machining for that particular uh, process and then come back so there are things of uh, there are ways of uh, handling this people uh, take some activities uh, or actions to uh, mitigate these risks by doing some outsourcing or by if it's a manpower issue then uh, again as i said there could be some uh, reallocation of manpower in the uh, process within the house from one project to another project or from one machine to another machine uh, so giving priority to the uh, particular item or uh, product which is more important for the company at that particular stage so this is a, this is also another area where uh, there could be issues in uh, uh, of delays of course supply and also there could be delays but, but generally if you have a good supplier and uh, if you have given him advanced uh, information about the orders uh, which are likely to place on there could there may not be delays but it could happen there also the, that there are delays there are some areas where there are some specific, specific components or parts which could be an issue provided this supplier is not a capable supplier so that's the reason i said when you uh, understand the capacity or study the capacity of the vendor you have to be very careful in <coughs> understanding this uh, uh, performance level how he, he takes action for uh, meeting our requirements whether he is uh, self sufficient or he, whether he needs support or what else uh, is the issue with him so so depending on the vendor we could also have so in the case uh, there are some issues there could be issues uh, on varying levels so we need to have uh, a contingency plan for uh, mitigating these things at, uh, at each level that's that's how i think uh, it is done yes so thank you i have another question uh, some of our enterprises are working on multiple products like not only one product they have different products some of them are related some of them are not very much related so they may be able to use same set of machines or same production process and all those things for few things maybe it may be little different for other products so when they set up a production unit and they do all this planning so how they can do it efficiently like what are the things they need to take care of? yeah so each product is a, if it's a different manufacturing line then you you have to plan for different manufacturing line. as long as i earlier also i mentioned this there could be some specific parts which are common to different products so you can have that as a separate line and then cater into two different so several areas several factors i have seen uh, some parts are common and some processes are common so the machines will be common so it's a specific machine uh it is used for a particular particular process then you you cannot invest in this machine for every product no so because it will be costly so such processes are uh, component manufacturing you will have to group and then keep it separately you don't merge it with the main process or mainstream line so that these are all common uh, yeah. because the capacity optimization can be done if everything is built into the main line itself you will lose capacity so normally uh, when you talk about a uh, single piece flow or a uh, cell manufacturing whichever is uh, dedicated to that line only is kept in that line whichever is common across the lines or across the product uh, manufacturing setups are generally grouped separately and then they they are given as they are treated as a supplier to the main uh, final assembly for example i'm just giving you an idea so there could be a like a supplier within a factory itself 
So they are different uh, uh, <laughs> manufacturing setup, not linked directly to the main setting line. So they they already they they have to be grouped together so that. But at the same time, if those processes are not very costly and uh, they are only manual operations or uh, small investments, you could have it in the main line itself or uh, dedicated to the product line. So because See, when you have a common uh, machine, which is catering to different products, there is one thing called as a setup changeover, which happens. So normally you lose some time in that between one part and another part when you change, you will have a setup changeover. So that could harm the, your uh, cycle time, it could harm your uh, quality. So you have to be careful in uh, uh, whenever you change setup, because once you do a setup, it is established, it is running. But when you change over to another component or a part, what happens is you'll have to stop it. Uh, dismantle the fixtures and the toolings for one product and then uh, mount the other toolings and other fixtures on the, on the machine, do some trials, establish the process. So this will take some time. So there could be a few hours, it could be a few minutes, or it could be a few days also, depending on the process and product. That's the reason in good manufacturing uh, processes, there is a, something called uh, as SMED, SMED process of setup change, single unit exchange of time they call. So maybe I'm giving you some extra information, but uh, that is, uh, see, what SMED means is you quickly change over from one product to another product. So within 10 minutes, if you're able to change over, that's, that's the best uh, benchmark figure. So, so that happens, uh, uh, SMED concepts, if you're having, and if you're not able to, uh, if you don't lose much of that, then it's good to have separate line and then do that. But if it is, uh, suppose, uh, you have to look at the SMD anyway for changing over from between components to components on a machine, on a common machine. Uh, but if it's not a very costly machine and you can have, afford to have two machines, each machine, one uh, manufacturing product line, you can still have it so that you don't have to uh, have this set of changeovers and you don't uh, need to worry about quality because it's already established process and it's running continuously without any changeover. So that's how uh, uh, companies look at it uh, when they plan for uh, this. Thing. So any common uh, facility, common uh, machine used for different product variants, generally they have it separately because uh, it is better to handle it separately, not integrate it with the main line. Okay, thank you, sir. Anyone else having any questions? And of course, these have to be looked at uh, uh, individually, case by case, which is better for that particular uh, company, which is better for that particular uh, because yeah. uh, it cannot be generic. <laughs> yeah, yes, sir. Um, sir, uh, do you suggest any tool for this or uh, just Excel? Ah, Excel is okay. You see, normally, uh, maybe sometime later, I'll, I'll try to find out any. Uh, you have a matrix, a product and a component matrix, uh, facility matrix. So normally when you uh, think up, say something like a lean manufacturing, you group uh, products. No? So at that time, when you have a matrix, you know which uh, product goes into which machines or which component goes into which machines. Suppose it goes into many of these, then you can group the, all that and then have it in the same uh, line. If it is not going, it is one or two separately, then you'll have to take it out and then uh, separate. That's how normally people do. Grouping the parts or grouping the processes, uh, uh, Excel sheet is enough. Should be okay. okay. Okay, thank you. So, so now we, we have come to the material planning. So material manufacturing, as I said, is uh, generally uh, uh, two types, make to stock and uh, make to order. Make to stock is generally used in uh, mass production, like automotive industry or you know, uh, kind of uh, mass production or mass uh, volume production of same. Make to order is used in small batch production or very low volume production. Like so for example, your products, which initially maybe your products uh, may not be having a really huge volume. But if it is, as long as it is a standardized product and you have got a uh, consistent volume of production every month or consistent demand, then you can switch over to the MTS kind of uh, manufacturing. Now, uh, depending on the type of business, organization should choose this material planning strategy. So generally in the MTS uh, kind, 
the strategy is based on stocking parts. Generally, what, what, what people do is you stock parts, all the parts because they are common, they use across the products, one, and they have a huge volume requirement. And then uh, they are continuously used. I mean, they are continuously consumed, for example, every day or every alternate day. So this is, they are called as runner items so generally, uh, or repeater items also. So, uh, so normally a term used as runner, repeater, stranger is used in some companies. Stranger is very low volume, once in a while used. A repeater is uh, periodically used. But runner is uh, almost on a daily basis. So this is how when the people are classified as parts. Uh, and there's another classification, A, B, C, D, and all that. So you must be aware of that. So A class is the regular item, cost items and all that. So, uh, so the strategy is based on the uh, stocking of parts. So mostly the parts are stocked. You have all the components uh, available. Every month you give an order to your supplier and then he keeps uh, supplying to you the material based on your uh, requests or whatever quantity you want. It could be 1000 this month or it could be 800 next month, it could be 500 next month. So basically, basically every month it is produced, every month uh, it is consumed. So you give to your vendor uh, some uh, advanced uh, information on a kind of a forecast you give. But every month you give the actual quantity. So this is how customers give it to you also. So they, they give an annual uh, plan month wise, but every month they give you a schedule. For example, this month I have to give this much, uh, you have to give me this much quantity. So it could be varying from the forecast, but the general forecasting given at the beginning of the year is normally used for a capacity planning purposes. So every year, uh, every month, uh, average uh, 150 to 100 numbers uh, customer needs. So I need to build my capacity to meet that. So that's how that forecasting is taken care. But every month, the production is based on the schedules which the customers give you on a monthly basis. So normally, uh, the good practice is what companies follow is one month firm order they give, one month firm schedule. Next two months is a uh, variable schedule. So for example, uh, in August, so they give you uh, in August, uh, for September, definite schedule. That means, suppose they say September 200 numbers I need, they will definitely take the 200 numbers. They will not uh, shirk away from taking it. Whereas October and November, they, it's a tentative schedule. One is one month for two months tentative. So they gave 200, 200 in the tentative schedule, but next one they will again confirm it. So <coughs> that 200 and 200, it might change to 150 or uh, it could be 15 to 20 percent variation also in that. Not more, but not more than fifty percent variation. So, so generally, this is how uh, manufacturing uh, planning is done, or material planning is done, uh, both from customer side and similarly, we also do it with the our supplier side. So, uh, yeah, so for mass production, this is how the strategy works. So, you continuously produce products, you continuously stock the finished goods. Or sometimes the finished goods are also stocked. You don't manufacture to order, you manufacture to stock it, and then you supply it to customer as and when need. So you have a stock of say 500 numbers, be ready. Next month, the schedule is for 350, you supply 350, and then you replenish the stock to again 500 and keep ready because the 350 could be anything next month, other one. So this is how uh, a mass production setup works. <coughs> So this is, there is a continuous uh, production, there is a con continuous uh, uh, withdrawal of the products from the customer, there is a continuous uh, consumption of the raw material or the components which uh, we get from our suppliers. So there is a continuous uh, manufacturing. So this is, but this needs a, generally a good forecast. So as I said, the customers give us forecast, one at the beginning of the year, and then they give a, every month there is a form uh, for one month and two months certain schedules which they give. And you use a, a material planning uh, process, uh, which I'll come to later on, uh, which is basically, uh, say, uh, there are lots of ERP software, uh, MRP software, like SAP, Oracle, and all that. So those things uh, will take care of these uh, uh, material uh, planning requirements. Uh, and in that also, uh, this planning process, there are some variables uh, which you need to fill uh, so that you avoid excess inventories and cash being involved. So the, uh, this is how the MTS kind of uh, uh, business <coughs> goes on. Now, the MTO type, next, when coming to MTO, it is relatively simpler in the sense that material procurement is done only after the customer order is received. So you receive a customer order 
and then you generate an order for your uh, manufacturing or also for your uh, components based on the bill of material. So suppose your bottled items are ten items are there, each based on the bill of material, based on the quantity required for each uh, product, uh, you generate the purchase order for your vendors. So customer order is for two hundred sets. You give the your order to the suppliers for two hundred sets. Suppose it's a common uh, item for two three products and two three orders are there. You group it and then give the order to your supplier. So this is how uh, the ordering or the material planning is done. And similarly, manufacturing also you do it similarly. For example, your customer order is uh, issued. Based on that, you manufacture, you produce the components in those. You you do the assembly. So in this case, what happens is. You don't have any possibility of inventory failure because you are only buying items, you are only producing items to based on the customer order. So customer he has given an order for a model, so you are giving it, so he will definitely take it. So there is no possibility of him not accepting the production one and uh, quantity variation also they will not be there, and you don't end up in having excess uh, parts or uh, finished goods inventory. So this is how MTO works. But the the other uh, flip side is. Your lead times for your MTO products and the products would be uh, higher for for your delivery because you need to wait for ordered materials to be received. Once you receive the customer order, you place your order on the first supplier. He takes some lead time for giving you the parts. So you have to wait. This all these lead times will get uh, added up. You do the assembly, and then you you do the manufacturing. You do this. So this is everything will take some time. So there is a lead time issue for MTO. So MTO kind of business. Generally, if you are not able to stock uh, some standard items, the lead time will be higher for your customer. Whereas MTS kind, you can even sometimes you can even give on the same day. So in my in one of my companies, as per my uh, the target was same day delivery. Ninety percent of the orders should be delivered on a single day basis. So you understand. So you can <laughs> imagine now how much uh, stock you need to maintain. You would have to have all the items in stock then. And finished goods part, not only the raw material stock. If your manufacturing lead time is only one day, then you can keep it in uh, component stock. But your manufacturing lead time is three days, then at least three days of finished goods you should have, so that every day uh, as soon as the customer order comes, you give it. So that's a different scenario. This is a different scenario. This is a different ball game. This is a different ball game. So it depends on what kind of a uh, uh, business uh, you are planning to have, and you want to have. And it's not that uh, the entire company is working on MPS or MPO. There could be a hybrid situation. There could be some high volume products which work on MPS. There could be some low volume products which work on MPO. So you can have a, a, a combination of both. Also, uh, this is what generally happens in, uh, in medium scale uh, production. Uh, generally, you also have MPS. You also have MPO. So, but in of course in automotive kind of industry, mostly it is MPS. It is not MPO. But in medium engineering industries like pumps or valves, solenoid valves, which I was there, so there could be always some products on MPS and some products on MPO. The case by case, the manufacturing strategy or the buying strategy or material planning strategy would be different, and uh, they will be suitably planned. So uh, when it comes to material planning, as I said earlier. You have a uh, standard material planning software like the ERP or MRP, whatever we call it. There are packages available. So the entire gamut of operations from order booking till the dispatch, they are captured and can be executed uh, through the software itself. Of course, there are some uh, uh, parameters which you need to fill into the software to be able to use it properly. Because uh, there are, of course, there are some uh, <coughs> lot of. Uh, uh, flexibility and the facilities features available in this software, uh, which can be used for uh, the planning. Purpose. For example, uh, even in uh, MTO or MTS case, there could be some parts uh, which supplier doesn't give you one off. For example, you order one number, he will not give. So there is a minimum order quantity uh, MOQ they say. So I can give you, for example, O rings. So he will say thousand numbers only. I can give minimum. I cannot give uh, even five or ten. So you may have to buy. As a standard package, uh, <coughs> an MOQ quantity. Uh, so your order value will always be for one MOQ quantity. That is thousand numbers. Your purchase order will be released only for thousand. So those factors can be built into your MRP system so that the purchase order is automatically created for thousand numbers and not for one number. Even if it is a 
um, one number uh, kind of one customer order but suppose uh, you have got uh, customer orders for only 10 numbers say, for, for the item but suppose the minimum order quantity is 100 or 100 then you will have to buy the 100 but next time when you when this uh, order comes balance 90 numbers are available in your stock so the ERP software takes care of that and it doesn't uh, generate a purchase order for your supply. So this ERP software takes care of such things automatically. You don't need to worry about it. So the, the features or the there are some parameters in which you need to fill in the ERP package, which you will have to take care of. The, the purchase uh, strategic sourcing team will have to take care of that. Depending on the part, depending on the supplier, depending on the lead time, there are other things uh, also, say lead time. Lead time also you can feed it to this ERP software. It will generate the PR only uh, purchase requisition or purchase order only when uh, it needs. For example, a component is needed only uh, one month later. Right? And if it is only uh, today, if uh, if a customer order comes, the purchase order will not be generated till the 10 days or 15 days based on the parameters what you said. So this automation of uh, metal planning is done is available in the ERP packages. SAP is a very good software which uh, I have been using uh, in many of my career. Most of the organizations which I was there, they were using SAP. Oracle also is one uh, good uh, package. People saw Ban. One was there earlier. But I don't know now whether it's uh, still there. These are some uh, soft, uh, material planning software, MRP packages which are available in the market, which is suitable, whichever is suitable. People can pro uh, procure and uh, install. Uh, in various levels. Of course, uh, for uh, these are suitable for medium and big scale. Very small scale organizations can use maybe simple Excel sheets or simple software <coughs> for calculating the material requirements because this may be too costly for SAP or it may be very costly to implement and uh, with a very reduced sales uh, value or a uh, manufacturing plan, this may prove uh, to be costly for you. Once the volumes pick up, maybe you can uh, look at that. But there are also other software uh, available, which uh, like say similar software on a low low scale. There are some domestic local software available, manufacturers available. Who can give you uh, software at a lower price? So maybe you can look at that also. Uh, there are available, but there are some customized software as well. So for calculating material. So depending on the organization size. Uh, and the nature, so we can uh, procure the appropriate software. Even SAP, as I said, MTO or MTS kind of. So there are uh, there are some parameters which you need to be. The SAP is configured according to what you want. So depending on the configuration, the SAP is installed by the uh, SAP manufacturer and their software providers. So that's how it goes about. So this is what is uh, generally done in the. You know, like, now, when it comes to uh, uh, vendor management, so uh, after the material planning software, uh, vendor management is one thing which I would like to talk about here. Vendors are generally to be involved right from uh, part development stage. So the earlier you involve your vendors in the development stage, if it's a new product I'm saying, uh, part development stage, uh, they should be involved right from the beginning. Then they will understand our requirements and give them enough time to uh, which will give them enough time to develop the parts. So if you give at the last effort of completing all your design and then uh, uh, verification and all that, then they will not have enough time. One. Then initially, when you develop the, when you involve them in your development, what happens is they can give you some ideas because <coughs> they may be supplying a similar part to somebody else, or they are actually <coughs> experts in that particular component manufacturing or that component design. They could give you some suggestions to. Uh, tweak your uh, part design so that it will, it will give you a better quality or a better cost. So these are these are all uh, possibilities uh, when you involve them right from the beginning. Uh, this will also uh, give them time. Lead time uh, they can be you can be sure that they will uh, give you on time during your development stage if you involve them again uh, right from the beginning. So they generally good practice is to be treated as partners. You treat the vendors as partners, not as a supplier. And, uh, so you, this will get uh, the best out of them uh, in terms of uh, lead time for development, part cost and quality. So they involve them, they also involve you, uh, with you in uh, improvements in the product uh, cost. So they, they do some improvements in the, by, by doing say value, or value analysis, these things they do. They share with you the cost reduction. So <coughs> this is how 
it happens. So we also normally big companies also when they call we used to do value engineering in product, and then the fifty percent of the cost we used to transfer it to the customer. Fifty percent we used to retain. So depends. So how it is taken uh, care. So normally uh, good uh, company professional company deals the vendors with respect uh, rather than putting undue pressure on them for cost reduction. Because that would lead to see in order to uh, if you give them too much of pressure they would. Uh, I mean, quality could be compromised. So, uh, and also quality improvements with the vendor. Uh, if you do as a team, you go there. Your task force can go there and analyze, uh, analyze the reactions or uh, you work with them, quality problems with them, uh, and uh, give them suggestions on how to improve quality. Then it will work. I mean, they also feel involved in the entire process, and they would like to help you as much as possible. Uh, going to the uh, either the lead time or the quality. So that way, vendor management is one important area which you need to uh, take uh, a careful view of uh, and involve them uh, upfront one and involve them in every activity so that uh, you get the best out of them. Now, uh, after that, quality planning. So as I said earlier, <laughs> when you do a planning. <clears throat> Quality has to be planned. So, quality planning is one uh, important subject which I thought I will for a short period of time. So, organization will have to have a quality management system in place. It's called a QMS. So, <clears throat> to ensure the product and process quality. So, quality management system needs to be framed uh, by the top management team along with some senior members of the company. Uh, so to begin with, generally companies have a, something called as a quality policy. So see, this is all, uh, if it is ISO 9000 company, I don't know how many of them, how many of you are there, but if it is certified for ISO, these are all uh, a given, I mean, everything needs to be done. But still, what I am trying to say is even without ISO or with ISO, if you have such things, in, you need to have such things in place uh, so that you are uh, ensured of a good uh, quality product. So you need to have some kind of a quality policy so to be stated. So this will help you to deploy the uh, management of the company's strategy. So it could come out of your uh, company's vision and vision statement and strategy. So what you want to do, what you want to be. So based on that, you can have a uh, quality uh, policy. It should state what are the key policies company wishes to follow, such as, I mean, you may say uh, customer focus, uh, customer rejection is zero. I want to be the leader in this. So employee involvement, I want to have uh, my entire uh, employee involved in the uh, quality management system. I want to be a leader in this technology of this product. So there could be some uh, issues uh, uh, which you want to focus, the management wants to focus. So which is mentioned in the quality planning. And these, these issues or the policies uh, which you are stating here will be taken up in your uh, uh, Deployment as a, uh, it will be deployed into your processes and products uh, I and mean, uh, procedures for different departments. So that's how uh, it goes into the down the line to the employee level. So you will have to frame the standard operating procedures to be framed department and process wise. So, for example, marketing, you have uh, if you take marketing, you, you, you can inquiry generation could be a process, and then uh, order booking could be a process. Collections could be a process. I mean, once you dispatch, you have to collect. So, so these different uh, processes could have different standard operating procedures or SOPs, what you call, uh, giving the responsibilities of the people who has to do what, what how is generally the uh, uh, process to be followed, and uh, what are the documents to be referred, what are the records to be maintained. So, these things are mentioned in the standard operating procedures, department wise and process wise. So this will give a lot of clarity to the people who are working in those departments. And it will also do a standardization of the process so that each person in the department will follow the standard process. Standardization of processes is very, very important to maintain a good quality and good system. Then clear work instructions for the operators. This is uh, another very important thing. Many companies, every company will have this. Uh, uh, they have it in a different ways. Each company will have its own way of doing but every process which is done in house, every process and activity will have a clear work instructions uh, giving for each process how they have to do. For example, even in assembly process, you take this component, you assemble this, you, you so what is the sequence of activities? 
So that is mentioned very clearly for the operator. What are the inspection he has to do? What the operator has to do? What is the incoming part inspection he has to do? What is the outgoing inspection he has to do after the process is over? So every stage, there is an incoming inspection for all the parts which are parts or sub which is coming to that stage. He, has, he inspects it and then he does the operation process. And then after the process is over, he has to check the output of the process. So every process will be checked twice, once by the operator in that process, as a going as part of outgoing activity, and then as a part of incoming activity by the next stage of process operator. So this is how <coughs> the processes process quality is uh, uh, maintained uh, at every stage. So this is how even with all this you could have issues, but you will have to find out what what are the issues. You do an analysis and then you have to look at uh, ways of uh, improving the process or you implement um, uh, mistake proofing activities like copa gates and then you give uh, uh, visual aids or uh, uh, photographs uh, good no good samples are given sometimes in some areas so that because everything you may not be able to document properly so this is good this is not good there could be some aesthetic issues no, which you cannot explain so you give photographs and then you also give a uh, visual aid you you have a good sample and a bad sample so the operator can very clearly see a good sample and a bad sample and then he will <coughs> decide whether it is okay or not if it is not okay or suspect product he is not able to decide then he will call the supervisor and ask he will keep it separate so he will not give it to the pass it on to the next stage so such kind of work instructions have to be given for each process uh, and activity even in um, design activity or process engineering activity, the office activities also, we will have clear operating procedures and work instructions for the people to follow. So that this helps you in standardization and for giving clarity. See, a lot of, you all know, many people know, uh, attrition levels are not very low. And at least uh, 10 to 15 percent per every company I've seen, uh, people uh, leave the organizations. Uh, so you will have to, uh, <coughs> Uh, look for that. I mean, so when you when people experience people leave and you recruit a new person, so what happens is again you have to train him. So one thing is one way of uh, training him or making him know is a standard operating procedure. So he will have to look at that. You explain to him based on the standard operating procedure what are the activities how he has to carry out. After that, he will take care of by looking at the document and then he will learn himself. So these standard operating procedures are very important for uh, any process in the organization, any in-house process, or man be it manufacturing or is it design or uh, production engineering or machine building activity, whichever way. So th these are things which have to be uh, taken care, documented properly and reviewed by the management. And these are all live documents. The sense what people say is in a quality management, good quality management system is uh, including the quality policy. I mean, quality policy may not be reviewed very frequently, maybe once in a year or two years or something because you will have to have a focus for at least two three years. But standard operating procedures, work instructions, these have to be looked at uh, frequently based on your analysis, root cause analysis of customer complaints or rejections, uh, in-house rejections, in-process rejections, uh, incoming rejections, whatever it is. So based on that, these have to be changed or tweaked uh, to ensure that next time it doesn't happen. So th there's something called as a corrective and preventive action. Now. So you take a corrective action for a, for a problem, you also need to have a preventive action. So when you take a preventive action, those things are standardized in terms of this uh, procedure, standard work instructions, standard procedures. So they will have to be updated to their work instruction so that these things don't happen again in future. So last uh, is the product wise control plan. See, this control plan is a very, very important document, which dis uh, defines actually how uh, a product uh, how the quality management uh, system is defined for a particular uh, product at each stage of the process. So I'll, I'll show you an example of a control plan and explain to you uh, in the next slides. So this is a very, very important document. This is again done as a cross-functional team by production, quality, production engineering team at least. So these are some areas, uh, <coughs> some <coughs> teams, departments which have to be involved uh, in the control. You can also have a, a design department or a, some other department as and when it is required, but generally it's a cross functional team approach to have the uh, all the ideas from every team uh, because everybody is contributing to that. So, so it is a team activity uh, for preparation of this control. But just like work instruction standard operating procedure, everything is a generally a team activity. 
of course the leadership of the team would be from that particular department but uh, it's done as a team so quality management system will have to include all the areas starting from supplier parts incoming quality in those process quality and customer quality so you you analyze the incoming quality you measure the incoming quality, uh, parts quality uh, what are the rejections from each supplier what's uh, what are the viewers doing etc and then again in those processes and then customer and rejections and uh, feedback is a very very important uh, for you to improve your processes you have to monitor it regularly uh, uh, as and when it comes, then you have to create a corrective and preventive action. You have to have a cross functional team uh, discussion on that. You have to do a root cause analysis. And then, when you complete all this, you'll have to have a preventive action, which, uh, which will be documented again in your uh, system as and uh, wherever it is required. So, this is, uh, this is how the quality management system will work, which has to consider the entire thing. This is how the quality planning is done. So all incoming components, as I said, to be inspected and certified for use. So this will only ensure that uh, your components are <coughs> okay for assembly. So, <coughs> so rather than uh, uh, finding out in the assembly stage that the component is not fit for use, it should be done at the beginning stage so, so that you don't add value and then reject it. So all the incoming parts to be inspected. So there could be some self-certified suppliers. So when self-certified suppliers are there, they could be exempted based on the frequent audit. So he is a self certified supplier. You frequently audit the supplier and find that, and going by your data, past data, he is not having, he is not giving you any rejected parts or components. He is good in terms of quality. Then you can say that I will not check it uh, frequently. I will only do a sampling inspection or I will do a sampling inspection very rarely. So I, I, I will exempt him from uh, inspection of the incoming parts. It can only be a minute inspection. All other parts, maybe a sampling inspection is, needs to be done where there is no self certification. For example, you will do uh, out of 100 parts, 100 components distributed, maybe you will do five components or six components or 10 components based on your policy. You need to have a clear policy for that and a working instruction. So, based on that, you take a call. You don't do 100% inspection, but there are some parts or components which you may have to do 100% inspection uh, considering the seriousness of the uh, or seriousness or criticality of the part in the product or also the supplier end performance. Supplier end is not uh, known for good performance, supplier is not known. Till this, such time the, company, the supplier is improved or a new supplier is uh, uh, established, you may have to follow 100% inspection for some parts. But that is uh, not a healthy sign, but sometimes you may have to do it on a short, short term basis. And as I said, the uh, every process uh, stage, the output quality of the part to be checked before passing on to the next stage. Rejections and rework to be monitored on a constraint. So, at the end of the shift, the rejections and rework to be noted down and they have to be analyzed by a team, by the supervisor and the security team for uh, any improvement which needs to be done uh, so that you don't uh, um, end up with a similar uh, rejection in the future. Once the product is dispatched to the customer, you check for any content and feedback and uh, review. So you need to have a regular reviews of the customer uh, inspection. So normally people have a management review meetings where the people also review the customer and rejections and what's happening in, in those rejections. Generally, the quality management system, effectiveness, how it is done, is uh, taken care by the top management. Once in a month, if possible, you can review uh, as a uh, as an MRM or management review meeting. Then the, the entire gamut of operations are reviewed. So the quality department head will present to the management what are the issues in quality, customer and you know, supplier and who are the issues, who are the issue suppliers, etc. etc. What are things which are regularly reoccurring and people are not able to solve? So these things, when it comes to the management's notice, then management can support in uh, improving the setup or providing some appropriate resources to the teams uh, to improve the processes. So the ones uh, clear work is just to be prepared for each process with facilities to use for checking quality and frequency of the, as I mentioned. So I will also um, explain to you later. So quality system audits to be done by senior person periodically. So normally any company will have a, a team of people, senior people, who do an internal system audit, so quality system audit. So every department they go, check with their procedures, whether they are following them, work instructions, whether they are being followed. Uh, uh, 
uh, what's happening there, the improvements are there are already agreed actions have been taken care of. All these system audits, whether the system is being followed, has to be done by the uh, this team of internal auditors. So internal auditor system is uh, something which all companies follow. So every company will have a team who will be who check the health. This is basically to check the health of the quality management system, whether it is effectively run, effectively uh, being followed. And if any improvements are required, so you'll have to make those improvements on a continuous basis so that uh, uh, see change is only permanent, as they say. No, you cannot have the same system again and again uh, for a, on a permanent basis. You'll have the same kind of rejections, you'll have the same kind of problems and issues. So, you'll have to improve the quality management system also. Uh, continually, you'll have to look for improvements based on the audit reports, based on customer visits. Sometimes, customers also visit you, so at that time. Uh, based on their inputs, uh, there could be some points uh, to be taken care of. So you look at that and then uh, implement it in your quality management system. So this is what is a, an example of a control plan, quality planning. So core team, actually normally what we mentioned is the uh, core team. Product, product, uh, what is the product number? What is the contact number? Who is the customer? Who are all involved in the preparation of this control plan? What we mentioned this. What is the date and revision? As I said, there is always a revision number. Control plan needs to be updated uh, periodically based on uh, your uh, experiences and the performance of uh, the product and the customer and the issues, etc. So, normally a control plan will be like this you, the entire process. Description is given here. So, first process, second process, third process, like this, it goes on. Uh, <coughs> what is the machine used or the device used, whether it's a manual operation or it's a machine or a, a temperature control, so thing is here, is written here. So, what are the characteristics to be checked? For example, in the product, in the process. So, product is whether it is done proper. It's the manual operation, so whether proper assembly is done or not. So, there is nothing in process here. So product output is checked. What is the product output here? Process uh, in temperature control, proper soldering because it's assembly and soldering. Whether the process soldering is done, but in the, the gun is used, the process characteristics to, uh, to be checked is the temperature. Whether temperature is maintained properly or not, which is very very important for this process. Similarly, the in the product side, soldering strength, whether it's okay or not, proper assembly. So this 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 assembly operation operation description machine description characteristics would vary from product to product i'm just giving you an example it has to be worked out for each of your products separately so the entire control plan is normally made for the final assembly there is one control plan for individual sub assemblies there is another control plan for parts which are made in house manufactured in house you will have a control plan separately so individually there are different control plans for the each process so uh, as long as it's an uh, integrated process you can have one control plan so here now, these are the characteristics. Uh, if any special characteristics or uh, customer specific requirements, there you have to mention here. <coughs> now in methods area. So here proper assembly we said. So the wires to be. So what is the process uh, here? Wires to be properly inserted into the grommet. This is the process specific uh, method. Uh, how do you evaluate visual? Whether it's a measurement technique is visual only here. Sample size, how much 100% you will have to check. Every part, every item you will have to check. Frequency is ongoing. So, what is the control method? You have to maintain a check sheet whether you have done it or not. Who is responsible? The operator is responsible. Reaction plan is what? If this is not done, you will have to refix the wires. That is a reaction plan. Corrective action is a future control plan. Similarly, here, temperature you are going to check. So, what is the specification? 350 plus minus 25 degrees. So, you will have to document it. And then, how do you do it? You have to have a measuring technique, this is a digital thermometer. You check it with that. So, what is the frequency of checking once in four hours? What is the method control is check? Who is doing it? Operator. If it is not okay, he has to adjust the temperature. So, solder area to be clean and clear for proper solder. It's a visual uh, inspection, 100 percent you have to do it. Again, operator is doing it. He has to resolder and clean. Similarly, for soldering strength, pull out load to be minimum. This what is the Instrument used push pull gauge which can check this pull out. And what is that? Start time you have to do n is equal to two numbers you have to check. Check sheet. Proper assembly. Gromit should project below the closing. It's a visual process. 
hundred percent yes check the operator should check. So like this, there could be some areas where the operator doesn't check, but the quality inspector checks. For example, you have to uh, check some uh, dimensions on a CMM, a coordinate measuring machine. Then it could be the supervisor who is responsible here, and then the CMM will be doing here. What are the dimensions to be checked? Will be so the control plan gives you the stage wise, process wise. What are the machines used, equipments used? What are the characteristics to be checked? What is the method of checking? What is the process characteristic? What is the product characteristic? How the process is ensured? For example, the proper SMB is manual. If it is temperature controlled, then temperature is temperature controlled, then it could be something. Suppose it's a, it's a machine, <clears throat> then speed and feed would be the uh, uh, specification. For a cutting machine or a radial drilling machine, or whatever. so that has to be checked here by the operator. So these are some things which this is what makes a control. Plan. This is a comprehensive quality control plan which has to be made as a team, or which will be there for each process. Noted down here: assembly process separately and machining process because machining process also there could be several processes involved like drilling, reaming, machining center operations. Uh, cutting bands are cutting like this. You, every process you have to put here. And then at each stage, what is the what are the characteristics to check for product as well as process is mentioned here. This is how uh, generally a control plan is uh, made, and this control plan is useful for you when you make a work instruction. So when you when the detailed work instructions are made for this assembly, for example, this first assembly and so on thing, the work instruction will contain that these things have to be checked. That's a detailed work instruction for this particular process. Similarly, there will be a work instruction for some other process. So, individual workstations will have one work instruction very clearly mentioning what is to be done by the operator, what checks he has to do, at what frequency, what is the instrument he has to use, what are the process parameters he has to set uh, in the machine. So, these things are mentioned in the control plan and also in the work instruction for each machine. So, this is, this is a very, very important tool or a document uh, which <coughs> helps the uh, quality to be maintained in the uh, process. So that's how it is called, quality control plan. So it has to be done by a, uh, a team of people. Have any questions on this? Uh, the quality control plan or? Okay. Now, so till now the control plan, uh, quality control plan. Now the facility planning, uh, I have some sheets here to show you. We said, uh, uh, how do you plan for facilities? So again, there's a uh, process planning sheet, facility planning. You have what is the product, what is the customer, what is the data revolution. Now, for each process, what are the machines involved, equipment details? For example, if you see the cleaning machine, what is the cost? Who is responsible? Ionized air blow, what is the cost? Flexible blow, total cost. Now, what are the jigs and fixes? Because not only the machine, you also have to have a uh, jig and fixture or cutting tools or whatever it is. So you will have to give the description here on the cost. Then the material handling details. Then what is the total cost? For example, you need to have conductive bits or you could have a uh, trace, uh, something like that. So, so what is the estimated cycle time for each of these? Options? This is done uh, at the time of a product development itself. Uh, I'm just giving you some information because this will give you an idea of the what are the equipments involved and how to calculate the uh, estimate the project cost. So that's the reason uh, this, uh, this is done. Uh, estimated cycle time is, uh, what is the man time, as I said, auto time. If it's a machine, auto time, uh, you have to write here. If it's a manual operation, the manual time will be there. What is your tag time? Three minutes. So three minutes, two, operator, two minutes, so there's no problem. There's only one operator. If the, the manual minutes are six and tag time is three, obviously you'll have two operators. Once. So this is how uh, a facility planning, the uh, process planning sheet is prepared at the beginning of a uh, product development program. So this is basically used to, during a development program uh, for estimation of your facility requirements and uh, uh, creating new facilities for your new product. Now, this is an example of an estimation for an entire plant. Okay. This is for a particular process and uh, uh, product. Estimation of the, I said uh, you have to uh, calculate the land, building, building. So what are the things which are involved generally, which you have to see? For example, land, I said, what are the land lease charges for the, what is the quantity square meters, what is the unit rate? These are some old uh, 
examples uh, which I told from my own uh, experience. So what is the amount uh, required for this? This is a, a new facility uh, estimation. So this is not for existing facilities, it's for a new facilities. Uh, so you have to build a new plant. So you can, this, this is how uh, it is done generally. So land, so, so this is AUC is asset construction. So you don't need to worry about this. So first is what is the land? Then what is the building? So what are the costs involved in this? So what is the quantity? What is square feet? What is the uh, unit of measurement is square meters or cubic meters or whatever it is? What is the unit rate for that? What is the estimation for that? So this is land, this is building. Now compound walls and drainage. What is it? So this is a bit detailed in nature, but this will be useful for you if you are going to construct a new plant. So that's the reason I'm just mentioning it here. This is, this is ultimate after doing all the production planning and all that. So you will have to have a, suppose you are interested in doing a new plant, then these things have to be taken care of the entirety. So that's the reason I'm just giving you this. Compound walls, roads and drainage, what are the estimation. Other structures, construction of some waters, underwater some drinking water, construction of temple, if, if required, I don't know. So uh, high tension yard, diesel storage tank, architect fee, government approvals, this is one thing which is needed for every plan to be set. What is the office furniture, production and other interiors? What are the uh, electrical works required? Furniture for office, production and other interiors. So everything is included here, assembly and inspection tables, material stages, training wall, electrical works, <coughs> transformer yard, BG set, factory electrification, all that. Then there could be some other assets like compressor, uh, EP APIs for telephones, data networking, PC servers, so specialized air system for the assembly lines. There could be some miscellaneous items like uh, landscaping and inventory, coolers, kitchen equipment, fire if you want to have cafeteria. So this is how an estimation is done for the entire facility. Uh, So that you will have an idea of what is the investment required, what is the capital budget required for this particular. So before this, of course, you should have done the uh, estimate of the uh, production planning. What I said is what is the capacity you have, what is the demand, what, what could be the number of uh, machines required, what are the processes uh, lines required, uh, and then what is the area layout, you, have, you should prepare a plan, uh, uh, and then estimate the area requirement. Then after that, you will do all these things for a, this is for a new plant uh, setting up. This is the estimation how you do. This is what uh, I thought I will uh, explain. This is again a, a way of facility planning. Uh, Stage-wise, what is the, uh, for example, a, a, a customer is Bajaj and then the instrument cluster is the product. So there could be several products going on. What are the processes planned at, at the new plant? What is that you want to do? What is, see, some, sometimes what happens is you have a base plant in, uh, say, Bangalore. And you have other uh, <coughs> new plant coming up there. So you make some components in the base plant itself, but you supply it to the other part, other plant. So interplant transfer is possible. So what are the subassembly parts done in the form of the plant facilities to be made in there? What are the facilities to be made there? So what are the line is targets? So this is a time schedule. When you'll be completing this, when you'll be completing this, when you'll be completing this. So line readiness is uh, this date. Then operator training unit you do, then you have to do the line commissioning and then start of production. So this is a time plan for this volume. What are the lines required? What is that? Exactly. This gives a, uh, a plan of a facility development uh, at the new facility. Now coming to, I think this is the last one. So <clears throat> organization structure. So uh, I'm not very sure how many, uh, how each of you are um, having the structure, but generally a company has to have an organization structure very documented. So a clear structure is to be in place, giving roles and responsibilities of the staff. So it should include all the areas and departments of the organization, such as, I mean, you start from marketing, you have a purchase department, you have a manufacturing department, uh, you have, if you have a single in charge, then you can have a head first and then branch it down to the next level. You can have a tree diagram. Uh, giving you all the different uh, uh, departments. So you have a design department, production engineering department, maintenance, source, quality, depends. Suppose sometimes you might have a common head for uh, several of these departments, then you can have a common head and then break it down to the next level. And then. So you need to have HR, finance. So being startups, 
I am not uh, sure whether you will have so many departments right now, but a good manufacturing setup, uh, a good plant, a good organization will have these things. <coughs> right now, maybe you have a common person looking at uh, two, three uh, different uh, portfolios or departments. So that's fine to start with. But later on, maybe you'll have to. At least you should uh, uh, keep in mind that these are, these are the things which uh, are required to have clarity in the your uh, organization and there is a clarity of roles and responsibilities for your staff so that there is no issue in the execution of the uh, goals or uh, objectives of the organization so when you look at that people will be very clear in executing the roles and responsibilities so clarity in roles and responsibilities will ensure the proper deployment of studies so when you deploy a strategy uh, this will ensure that the job is done uh, correctly to your uh, to the management's expectations and to the organization's expectations and uh, target levels. Employee involvement is uh, very vital uh, to deploy the management's uh, mission strategy. So, so you can have a different level for different sections of mission. For example, see normally many companies, good companies have the workforce or the operator level people uh, formed as a process or quality. <coughs> Survey committee or what you say, quality service. So, quality control service, they say. So, the QCC teams are formed with uh, several operators going into the same area so that they look at uh, how the uh, operations can be improved, how the problems can be solved, etc. For the staff, there could be supervisory teams, again, cross function teams, which can be. So, these are all uh, uh, activities which will involve the employees uh, uh, in the management process and the entire organization which will give a better result and benefit to the organization. Uh, that's the reason the employee involvement is uh, very, very vital actually. Uh, especially the Japanese kind of uh, environment, you, you feel that this, this is done very excellently uh, at different stages and different levels. So depending on the organization, you can have uh, different levels of it. What I'm trying to say here is, I mean, the entire uh, workforce may not be involved in all the decision-making process of the organization, or all the activities of the organization, but appropriate uh, levels, you can have those people uh, in management, uh, in the in managing the affairs of that particular area. So, for example, workforce will be very good in uh, knowing their machines and they know the processes, they know the quality requirements. So, they know how to, what will give the best in that particular machine or uh, process. So, so, improving the process, they have to be involved fully, rather than an engineer going and telling them this. Okay, engineers also have to give their inputs. But involving the operator in the, in the entire improvement process will help in uh, a better understanding of the process and better improvement uh, process. And their involvement and, uh, is very, very vital in executing that particular improvement. Otherwise, if he is not interested in the involve, uh, implementing that, this will never happen. So that is one, uh, that's the reason I said employee involvement is a very, very important uh, uh, duty. Uh, to deploy the management's uh, vision and strategy. So I think uh, that's all uh, from my side. Uh, I just try to give a broad uh, view, a generic view of the entire uh, gamut of operations in a manufacturing industry. Uh, some of them could be in generic, some of them uh, maybe you'll have to look at in depth when you go into the next level. Uh, some of these things could be uh, applicable to you, some of these things may not be applicable, but it's okay. But this is just generally a, 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 a wide view of how manufacturing companies work today, uh, good manufacturing companies work today, how to benchmark your activities against that. So to begin with, you can start with a smaller scale. As in the, when you improve, then it can be, uh, so as you go on, you will have to, you, you, you will improve yourself based on the feedback and based on your requirements. So that's how organizations evolve. You know? So being started, you 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 have to start somewhere. So, but as in the, as you go on in the process, definitely things will improve and the management's uh, sites, both sites and your involvement will definitely improve the organization as you go along. Thank you so much uh, for all, for your patience. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Caesar and uh, CP Mall, thank you for helping uh, in making this uh, presentation. Uh, I, uh, I'm not very sure how uh, I meet, met, whether I met your requirements full or uh, Of course, it's the first uh, uh, 
uh, initiative. So I think uh, uh, as we go along, maybe we can look at it that. It was very good. Thank you very much. I think um, your experience and your, your expertise uh, shown through this presentation. And uh, it was a good, uh, I mean, I'm sure others would uh, have to say, uh, the, our uh, partners will have to say, but um, from my perspective, I thought it was a good, uh, uh, like a reference um, uh, information and uh, um, document sort of a thing that you actually prepared and uh, um, informed everybody. I think it's, these are some basic set of information that one uh, should have before they actually uh, as they embark on uh, production planning and everything, exactly. one should understand the good uh, best practices. So from that perspective, I think you have covered uh, all the key concepts. Um, at least that's what I felt. Um, of course, uh, the others, uh, the people who attended, the participants and the partners who will have to tell how useful and how, how they found it. <laughs>